Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, this is the fourth week of the psychedelic state and the last lecture. So thanks for everybody who has made it with me this whole time. And welcome to those who have come for the first time. Uh, so today, our topic is wisdom. Uh, we'll talk about why that's the case and, um, well, talk about it a lot in many senses. Um, but just to begin, for those of you who are new, I'll give a recap on sort of um, what this is, why we're doing it, who I am. So this is a series put on by the Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Um, it's part of an educational effort uh, to translate the research on psychedelic compounds to the general public, uh, as well as to provide um, a objective take on uh, what we know about psychedelics so far. Uh, we are also motivated from a harm reduction perspective, and as there's a lot of information coming about uh, psychedelics, more and more people are interested in partaking of these kinds of experiences, so uh, you know, knowing is half the battle, so providing a frame for understanding psychedelics um, also involves um, understanding that a lot of people who are procuring this kind of information are here uh, for practical purposes, um, so if you do have any questions, don't shy away from being as specific as you need to be, because, um, yeah, that's part of the point of the lecture, is to give reasonable information that can help you um, reduce the harms and maximize the benefits of um, compounds of this variety. Now, uh, CSSDP is involved uh, in a lot of areas, uh, but at U of T, we're very focused on um, psychedelics, so, uh, I sometimes joke that we are the Canadian students for sensibly doing psychedelics, uh, as uh, we're the only chapter that really focuses on this. There's a lot of other groups that focus on cannabis advocacy, opiate uh, addiction crisis, etc. Uh, but here in Toronto, um, this is kind of the main thing. So. Uh, one of the things to look out for in the future is a conference called Mapping the Mind with Mushrooms um, that happens every September and uh, will be happening again and always features a bunch of great researchers from North America, uh, from various universities, people who are actually doing the research. So if you're interested in keeping up to date, uh, that's something to look out for. Uh, I'm Dan. I'm a student of cognitive science here at the University of Toronto. Um, I'm in the last year of my undergrad and I'm hoping to go on to do master's studies on precisely the subject. Uh, it's basically what I came to U of T to study, and so uh, the content of the lectures is largely a culmination of work that I've done under a variety of professors, um, especially uh, the professor John Verbeke, who uh, also speaks elaborately on the subject, so if you're interested in further information, uh, John is a great resource to check out, and he has a whole playlist full of uh, information about psychedelics on his YouTube channel. Uh, so. Moving on then, um, today we have a number of resources uh, on the science of wisdom and on various wisdom traditions. So uh, if you write down this link, this will take you to a Google Drive folder where I have uploaded uh, a variety of papers and texts that will uh, summarize or add to the material that is covered in this lecture and in other lectures. And you can also find content from uh, the other lectures as well. And there's a whole bunch of uh, scientific publications, uh, which usually you have to pay to get, but of course um, that's ridiculous, so they're all up there for free. Uh, so go ahead, read, educate yourselves. Um, there's also a number of interesting resources on uh, different psychotechnologies or practices of the mind that can uh, presumably enhance one's um, capacity to have a effective mind and uh, to perhaps engage more readily with the psychedelic experience. So what's the Oh. Uh, his last name is uh, V E R V A E K E. V E R V A E K E. Yep. Uh, Verveke. First name John. And his name will come up here as well if you need to refer to it. Actually, he should be here soon as well. So, on the agenda today uh, is. The following. So we're going to talk about what is wisdom. Um, we're going to talk about categories from the science of wisdom. Uh, after we do that, we're going to look at a Buddhist perspective on wisdom, um, a Jewish perspective on wisdom. Uh, we're going to talk specifically about the psychotechnology of imaginative personification. Um, that's a name that I have developed to kind of capture a bunch of various um, techniques that uh, psychotherapists and mystics both make use of. Uh, and then we're going to talk very briefly about what else wisdom traditions can offer um, for how to live a good life, because that's predominantly what wisdom is about. It's about how do we live well and uh, flourish in the world. And of course, we'll be relating this all to the psychedelic research as we go. So what exactly is wisdom? 
So wisdom is often broken down into a few categories, um, though they might not be called these. You will often find these three kinds of distinctions. So we have, first and foremost, philosophical wisdom, uh, which focuses on rationality as a means to developing justified true belief. So uh, you'll have, uh, for example, Aristotle focusing on this as a primary means of wisdom, uh, and Plato in his dialogues precisely goes about the process of conversing and transforming our belief um, such that we develop uh, the most accurate and true knowledge that we can, and th that true knowledge is supposed to translate uh, into uh, virtuous action. Now, there's also um, a distinction called practical wisdom, um, which compared to uh, knowing what is true and what is the case, um, it's knowing how to act, knowing how to give advice and how to form effective judgments and have effective intuitions about all of the various problems uh, that one comes across, such as um, should you marry such and such a person? Should you um, take on that new job? Should you apply for a particular degree, etc. Now, all of this is often uh, wrapped up in the category of cosmic or divine wisdom, at least insofar as the ancient world was concerned. In our more secular context, we don't really find this as much, and we, con er, we focus uh, a lot on the practical and the philosophical side, um, but there is also th the notion that wisdom is not just a property of people, it's not a property of individuals alone, but it's a force of the cosmos by which things are brought into order. Um, so. You can see uh, I left a quote from Proverbs here, which is, I think, very good at articulating very clearly this idea. Uh, by wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. So wisdom is also a property of the cosmos, and it's by coming into contact with this property of the cosmos that human beings participate in a genuine kind of wisdom, which will be very important when we look at the Jewish perspective on wisdom, uh, because one of the primary points of that is that um, personal individual wisdom doesn't mean anything at all. You can be as wise as you want, but that capacity for wisdom might also make you a terrible person. You have to sort of um, yoke it to the cosmic wisdom that stems from God in order for it to be effective or meaningful. Now, of course, the obvious question is, well, what does this have to do with psychedelics at all? Well, you can find any number of sources that will connect the wisdom traditions of the world to psychedelics. So here's a few. Um, the first one is The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross over there. Um, that is a great book. Uh, it was written by John Allegro, who was one of the translators of the Dead Sea Scrolls when they were first found. And the whole point of the book is basically that uh, the entirety of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and even of portions of the Bible, are all just mushroom puns. It's all just an elaborate puzzle meant to indicate that eating the flesh of God doesn't mean a kind of pseudo-cannibalism. It means literally eating a mushroom and that Christ is a mushroom. And it's great to watch interviews from this too because it's like there's these black and white videos of this man in a suit in 1950 talking to these extremely religious people uh, and they'll be like, are you trying to tell me that Christ is a mushroom? And he says, yes, completely. And he's like, Doesn't, isn't that sacrilegious? How could an altered state be something that Christ could initiate? And he's like, well, you know, I'll give you a hundred reasons why. Uh, it's really funny to see that clash of culture. Um, so the book in the middle here, we have um, The Road to Eleusis refers to um, the Ellicinian mystery cult. Uh, I mean, we call it a cult now, but it was actually a very uh, large institution within ancient Greece. Uh, Plato was one of the famous initiates of the Ellicinian Mysteries, and there's a great dialogue. I wish I remember the name of it, uh, but he's, um, Socrates is casually conversing with an interlocutor, and he says, oh, are you staying around for the Ellicinian Mystery? It would be great. You know, you can actually just come and see what the divine is like, and the person's like, no, I gotta like catch a boat somewhere. Um, but yeah, he recommends this method as a method for um, gaining access into uh, even philosophical knowledge. And the idea is that um, there was some sort of psychedelic experience that was being produced in these rituals, uh, perhaps using the fungus ergot, which is uh, the precursor to the chemical LSD. That is what LSD was synthesized from. It grows in barley. Um, it's a parasitic fungus. And uh, there was supposedly some drink made out of this. And then the participants of this ritual would uh, drink this and the priests would facilitate the hallucination of uh, the resurrection of the goddess Persephone when she emerges from hell in spring. Now, we've also got Buddhism here. Um, I won't comment too much on that one, um, but you don't really even need to because like Tibetan Buddhism is crazy. It's full of people hallucinating and like dreaming and astral projecting. So like regardless of whether or not they're using drugs, there's something related there. Gnosis um, refers to Gnosticism, which is actually the same sort of thing that is going on in the Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. The early Christians um, were called Gnostics by the early church fathers. It's usually used as um, a pejorative term, but uh, the process of Gnosis refers to this felt 
sense of acquaintance with divine truth, which is precisely what happens in the mystical experience occasioned by psychedelic drugs. People feel as though they contact divine truth. Uh, famously, Timothy Leary wrote um, a book on how to use psychedelics based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Um, we have DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, which talks about how the experiences of the Hebrew prophets is like those of uh, the DMT experience. This book relates Zen to the psychedelic experience, and the Cosmic Serpent, of course, talks about uh, the role of psychedelics in shamanic contexts, uh, facilitating the development of actual knowledge. And so if you look at cultures all across the world, anywhere that there has been the institutionalization of the use of psychedelics, it's always been reserved for the wisest of people to either take or administer those drugs. So there's a very strong relationship between wisdom and between psychedelics. So we're gonna go a little bit over um, some of the main scientific views that we see in the uh, research onto wisdom. It's very interesting because a lot of people don't really know that there is a science of wisdom, but this research has been done since about the 1980s, um, starting with this fellow, um, not this guy, but uh, the name Paul Baltz. And this is the Berlin wisdom paradigm, uh, or so it's called. They articulate wisdom as an expert knowledge system dealing with the conduct and understanding of life. So basically being an expert in how to give advice, how to think about uh, the practical problems involved in uh, being alive. So here's a quote from a more recent paper of theirs. Individuals use this knowledge to construct their lives. Alternatively, they help co-construct the lives of others through good advice, exceptional judgment, excellent mentoring, or insightful organization of education and society. Uh, so wisdom is a kind of excellence, a kind of um, knowing how to live and how to guide others in living as well. So this is how they measure it. Um, they'll give people these small vignettes, uh, and then they'll just basically ask people to write out what they would do in these situations. So uh, in this situation, they're asked, uh, a 15-year-old girl wants to get married right away. Uh, there's a few different groups that are asked different versions of this question in different forms to see if the perspective uh, that is elicited by the question has any effect on how people are answering. So for example, uh, group A is asked, what should one or that person consider and do? A more of a third person um, observational kind of perspective um, versus imagine you're directly talking to her uh, or imagine it's your own daughter and this person is um, thinking of getting married right away. So. They use what's called a think aloud protocol. So they just get people to talk about it. They record them, transcribe the results, and then they have uh, a set of independent raters um, marking it um, on a number of items that I'll show you in a second. Um, but I just want to give you another example of one of the vignettes that you're using. Uh, so another one that they will give to participants is somebody gets a phone call from a good friend. The friend says that uh, they can't go on anymore and that they've decided to commit suicide. What could uh, one or this person consider and do in such a situation? So these are the five criterion for determining levels of wisdom. Uh, we have high levels of factual knowledge, procedural knowledge, lifespan contextualism, which uh, just means that you understand that at different points in one's life, there is different contexts, which is important for understanding this problem. Uh, things vary as one age. Uh, that kind of plays into the fourth point as well on value relativism. Uh, so understanding that different cultures have different values, and so that can change how we might answer these questions. And the last one, of course, which always shows up in accounts of wisdom is recognition and management of uncertainty. So life is fundamentally uncertain, complex, almost impossible to understand. Uh, and if you're too dogmatic, then probably you're not that wise about things, at least according to these systems. There's definitely cases where that can be useful. Um, Oh, and just for the point of more specificity, each of those is put on a seven-point scale. And so um, when people are listening to the recordings or reading transcripts, uh, they'll say um, one being not very high on that, seven being very high on that, uh, and then we'll get an average of how that person scores uh, according to their wisdom score. Uh, so I like this. Diagrams are always great. Um, this is what Boltz and uh, his co-author Smith uh, articulate as the uh, dynamical system of expert knowledge that constitutes wisdom. So you kind of need a little bit of each of these. Just having one of these facets isn't really enough for making the kinds of decisions we associate with wisdom. Uh, you need to have them all sort of interacting. Okay, so here's a few examples of what it looks like when somebody is uh, responding wisely or not. So for the first one about a 15-year-old marrying somebody, uh, this is what counts as a low wisdom score. 
A 15-year-old girl wants to get married? No way. Marrying at age 15 would be utterly wrong. One has to tell the girl that marriage is not possible. After further probing, so this person just stops there, they have to be questioned, um, it would be irresponsible to support such an idea. No, this is just a crazy idea. That doesn't show any of the five things that we talked about at all. Um, high wisdom score, though, you'll see there's much more content in this, shows much more reasoning, thinking about it. Um, well, on the surface, this seems like an easy problem. On average, marriage for 15-year-old girls is not a good idea, um, factual declarative knowledge. But there are situations where the average case doesn't fit. Perhaps in this instance, special life circumstances are involved, such as the girl has a terminal illness, understanding lifespan context, or the girl has just lost her parents, and also this girl may live in another culture or historical period. Perhaps she was raised with a value system different from ours. In addition, one has to think without adequate ways, or one has to think about adequate ways of talking with the girl and to consider her emotional state. Right, so um, that also indicates um, different pathways to approaching this, right? You don't want to just say, you're wrong, you can't do this, no more talking about it, because, right, that might not produce the resolution that might make that person more likely to do it. But rather, we want uh, an approach that considers their perspective, um, reasons about it with them, and maybe facilitates an insight of their own. And that would be uh, a wiser way to approach the problem. So we have uh, another researcher. Her name is Monica Ardelt. She works um, in Florida, and uh, she has a slightly different way of understanding wisdom. So she considers it to be a dimension of the personality. So uh, where Baltz considers it to be a measure of knowledge and knowing things, um, for Monica Ardelt, uh, wisdom is something more like uh, a actual quality of the person. So you are a wise person, you have certain personality traits that make you more disposed to wisdom. And importantly, only um, individuals who are high in all three of her wisdom personality dimensions, uh, you can't just have one, are considered to be wise. So the first dimension is um, the reflective dimension. Uh, you have to be willing to take on others' perspectives uh, that are different from yours to be able to see things from other people's uh, point of view. Uh, you have to learn from mistakes and overcome defense mechanisms. You have to be open to self-examination, self-insight, self-awareness, which all makes sense, right? If you are unwilling to question yourself, then probably that doesn't make for very good uh, or wise conversation. Uh, there's a cognitive dimension. You have to have a desire for understanding truth, even if that truth may compromise self-image, an ability and willingness to understand the situation or phenomena thoroughly, and accepting the unpredictability and uncertainty in life. Right. So there's that uncertainty dimension again. And there's also the affective dimension. So um, compassionate love for others, directing positive emotions and actions towards others. Um, this is a part that is definitely a positive about uh, Ardell's system because um, Paul Baltz doesn't really have uh, much room for an effective component. It's kind of implicit within the system. Uh, but it does seem and is emphasized by many wisdom traditions that compassion, loving kindness is kind of the route towards wisdom. And without that, um, then all you have is this highly intellectualized machine which may not uh, be able to see where people are at. And so interesting, for this particular system, uh, measures of wisdom, according to uh, Ardelt's research, are related to subjective well-being, um, more so than objective conditions like age, socioeconomic status, um, current financial situation, health or physical environment. So if you feel uh, that your life is a life well-lived, then often you are going to rate higher on uh, these measurements. Which makes sense, right? Because you would think that um, you would be able to come to terms with and be at peace with your surroundings uh, if you were, in fact, wise about those surroundings. Uh, but some of the criticisms against this are that uh, wisdom is no more than emotional intelligence slash competence. I put that slash there because intelligence already has a definition and calling it emotional intelligence is confusing. Um, so emotional competence is a bit more accurate. It seems that um, Monica's system breaks down into that measure instead. Uh, and her three-factor structure has been shown not to replicate. Um, others have found four dimensions. Um, there was a researcher who found that three simply didn't appear, um, but didn't provide an alternative. So sad robot as a result. OK, so now we're going to talk about the model of wise reasoning. This is one that I'm going to focus on a lot, because I think that it has the most direct application to the psychedelic experience. Um, so we're going to return to this model a lot, um, and maybe refer to the other ones a little bit. So instead of talking about um, a system of knowledge that one has or a personality trait that one has, uh, Igor Grossman talks about wise reasoning, so the ability to think about a problem wisely. 
Um, it's, in his own words, the use of certain types of pragmatic reasoning to navigate important challenges of social life, uh, featuring predominantly dialectical thinking and intellectual humility. Um, so, of course, taking different perspectives, recognizing the limits of knowledge, again, we see that, making flexible predictions, searching for compromise. And the interesting thing about this notion of dialectical thinking is, well, how did Plato and a lot of ancient philosophers write? In dialogue. What is the purpose of those dialogues? To si simulate several perspectives at one time to initiate a transformation of one's worldview. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to focus um, mostly on how this system is articulated in this paper. Um, Grossman's research is interesting because if you look at different papers, he'll add a dimension here or there or take one away. Um, but uh, this one has uh, an aspect which I think is particularly important um, in that it refers to a bunch of qualities uh, of the particular state a person is reasoning in that predict their capacity to reason wisely. Um, and so that's going to be super relevant for us. So how they're measuring in this system, uh, the principle of wisdom whoops, is by getting people to journal uh, over uh, a several week period about various difficult life circumstances that they're coming across. Um, so what they do is uh, they use a method that attempts to minimize recall bias by guiding participants to select specific negative experiences they've had, reconstructing concrete circumstances of the experience, um, including the incident, time, location, presence of other people. Uh, and then once they've gone through this, uh, and this is like a thing that's emailed out to them, they do it online, uh, they then will talk about how they tried to solve that problem. And uh, after that, they'll uh, assess on a number of different measures uh, how they performed on a set of uh, criteria that measure wisdom, which, of course, there are definitely biases in self-assessed ways of doing this, um, but uh, there is a team of raters that will review that information afterwards to identify if it's accurate or not. So wise reasoning involves um, intellectual humility, self-transcendence, and the consideration of others' perspectives and compromise, um, and the integration of others' perspectives into how you're reasoning about things. Uh, here's an example of how they are asking questions about them. Uh, so you'll see that under intellectual humility, we get, for example, something like, for better understanding of the incident, it's important for me to have more information and knowledge about the circumstance of the incident. Then they strongly agree or disagree. Um, so if you think that you're really good at just solving all the problems, you don't really need anybody else's perspective, uh, then you would uh, rate one, and then they would say, well, you're probably not that wise, because who are you to know everything? Uh, Self-transcendence uh, indicates uh, looking at things from a third-person perspective. Um, Question two is interesting for that one. Uh, as you thought about the incident, did you feel immersed in the experience, rather distant from the experience? Um, so, you know, it's about, you know, how involved do you feel yourself being in it? If you're overly involved, you might get overly emotional and maybe really angry about it and not able to reason about it from an objective perspective. But this kind of self-distancing uh, does facilitate people uh, solving their problems more wisely. And so, yeah, they'll also, interestingly, uh, get a number of other measures, such as um, emotional intensity. So we'll ask them uh, on a range of uh, a few emotions, varying from very negative to very positive. Um, how strongly did you experience these? Um, they'll take that and compare that to see if it's predictive of people's responses on these questions. Uh, they'll also get a measure of emotional complexity, so how many emotions did they experience in the context of reasoning about this. And uh, they'll get a measure of construal, so at what level of analysis are people thinking about the problem? Big picture or in a concrete, detail kind of way? Okay, so this is an interesting quote. Whoops, and it's gone. There it is. Specifically, people showed fluctuations in their report of wise reasoning in the face of challenges of everyday life, with very modest day-to-day within-person consistency and substantial within-person variability. These fluctuations were systematic, with greater intellectual humility and self-transcendence in social versus non-social situations, and greater self-transcendence over the course of writing a diary. At the same time, people's average tendency to reason wisely turned out to include a stable individual differences component. Furthermore, we observed a great, greater number of state as compared to trait level associations with wise reasoning. So that's interesting. Um, you know, compare this to Monica Ardell's view, which is that there is a particular um, quality of one's personality, um, a trait or set of traits that one has. Uh, this one 
indicates that rather um, there are more state levels. So like what particular set of mind are you in at this moment? Uh, predictors that will uh, give us a better indication of people's capacity to reason wisely. And also uh, within this quote, it mentions that uh, two other things of importance. One, that there is greater within person variability for uh, wise reasoning than there is between person variability. Uh, nobody's really regular or reliable in being able to do this, so that's a problem. How do we increase our reliability in reasoning wisely? And also, um, in social situations, if you're talking to other people, then that facilitates wise reasoning, whereas if you're just thinking about it from your own perspective, on your own, without talking to anybody, uh, then, well, you don't do as well on these measures. Uh, which is cool because what they can do in these kinds of experiments is just to say, imagine talking to somebody else, and then just imagining the conversational context is enough to facilitate wise reasoning, just like in those dialogues, perhaps. Okay, so these are the state level things that predict variability within individuals. So if you are involved in a bigger picture construal of the event, so looking at things uh, as they cohere as a whole, as opposed to in their particular details, that is predictive of wise reasoning. Uh, more positive versus negative emotions, uh, greater emotional complexity, so a wide range of emotions experienced within the state, uh, less thought suppression, lower emotional reactivity, and more reappraisal and forgiveness. Okay, so if you've been here previously, you will notice that literally all of these things are what happen when you take psychedelics. So, maybe psychedelics are a state that facilitates wise reasoning. That's basically going to be one of the main points of this, right? Um, we know that all of these things are true of the psychedelic state. Um, we talked about, for example, uh, emotions as information processing parameters. So, they initiate a bias towards positive mood, um, and this positive mood is associated with a greater capacity for, for uh, solving problems via insight, which requires the sort of uh, big picture level thinking that helps you reformulate a problem uh, to have a new formulation that will give you a better grasp on a problem. And this is interesting because if you situationally induce positive mood in an experimental context, you can push people towards being able to solve problems via insight over analysis. Um, just by priming them with happy thoughts and feelings <laughs> before they go into the experiment. Uh, so there's a strong relationship between um, emotions, mood, and our ability to solve problems in various kinds of ways. Uh, and also we know that there's, for example, less uh, reactivity uh, in automatic emotional responses in our lower cortical areas, such as the amygdala, uh, under the influence of psilocybin. Um, there was some research we talked about last week where um, people gave a mild dose of psilocybin to a bunch of individuals and then showed them horrific images of car crashes and people being stabbed and weapons being held at them. And actually, people responded less negatively and there was a less um, prominent automatic burst of activation in the amygdala as a result of being shown these images compared to a control condition where uh, there was no drug given at all. So lower emotional reactivity um, and, like I said, all of this other stuff's going on. Oh, and one thing I should mention, actually, is that there was a really good paper, uh, 2018, on uh, using psilocybin to treat alcohol use disorder. And they, they mentioned that, um, point six here, uh, more reappraisal and forgiveness was one of the primary factors that they found in people's reported experiences for mediating their positive changes as a result of their psilocybin therapy experiences. So lots of convergence here. All right, so the only significant associations between, uh, between person variability, um, so taking multiple persons, comparing them to each other, in wise reasoning concerned greater emotional complexity and a greater tendency to reappraise the situation, um, and a significant relationship to concrete versus bigger picture construal for self-transcendence. So there's a few of the items that do give us between person comparison, but um, not as strongly as if we're just looking at one person uh, in on their own. So um, an interesting thing about this is that in the research on psychedelics, there's a lot of emphasis on this thing called the mystical experience, right? We talked about that two weeks ago. Um, one of the primary kinds of mystical experience, at least the one that we're emphasizing in research, is uh, the unit of mystical experience uh, so that's featuring qualities of oneness, um, love, transcendence, uh, a loss of self. And ultimately, it's a state of kind of contentless bliss where one feels absolutely connected to everything uh, in the cosmos. And so there's been a number of publications that say, well, it's the mystical experience that seems to be mediating people's uh, 
transformation into well-being as a result of undergoing psychedelic-assisted therapy. Um, but, like I mentioned, there was that paper, 2018, um, by the New York University team researching alcohol use disorder and psilocybin as a treatment, uh, and they found that, well, actually, in comparison to this mystical content, um, it seems as though this reappraisal and forgiveness is what we want to be looking out for and facilitating. So, um, my perspective um, used to be that we need to look at more kinds of mystical experiences, but I think that actually it's now more productive to look at something called a wisdom-promoting experience. Because when we talk about mystical experiences, we also run into the problem of, well, where do we draw the boundaries that what we're admitting as mystical into our conversation about science? Um, because it's not really legitimate to only pick and choose a certain subset of things as mystical, right? Union with God is one kind of acquaintance with the divine, but it's not the only kind, and maybe it's not even the most important kind. But further, perhaps it's more productive to look uh, at what makes people more wise. Because it's also not uncommon to have people be contacted by spirit entities from the Pleiades when they're doing a lot of DMT, and to think that they've been given some transcendent divine message that transcends the authority of anyone here on Earth, and then they just keep trying to do more and more DMT until they can break through the universal code and be the savior of us all. And I don't know, that doesn't really sound like a great plan. So we can perhaps be a little clearer about what we're looking for in psychedelic therapy and in wisdom-promoting uses of psychedelics by talking about wisdom-promoting experiences. So uh, this is a preliminary definition. This is something that I'm going to try to work on and flesh out a little bit better, but this is what I have come up with as a de definition for this so far. Uh, a wisdom-promoting experience involves a series of alterations of consciousness consistent with the state-level predictors for wise reasoning. A wisdom-promoting experience must reduce within-person variability for wise reasoning over the long term. That is, it must create a lasting change in one's ability to reason wisely more consistently. And I think that that is the important part, is that it has to make a person more wise more consistently. Now, oh, did I? Ah, yes. So let's look at a few other things, right? Because that applies not only to the psychedelic experience and certain kinds of psychedelic experience, but also psychotherapy. So if you go into a psychedelic therapy, or if you go into a regular psychotherapy session, um, how do we know that it was a wisdom-promoting experience? Well, did you experience lots of emotions? Were there more positive versus negative emotions? Um, did it promote you? Did it promote a bigger picture construal of events in you? If we can say that these things are true, then we can say that perhaps this is a positive uh, growth promoting experience. There's also this notion of post-traumatic growth, very much related to the psychotherapy notion, but uh, there's some problems because when we talk about post-traumatic growth, you know, the idea that suffering makes you stronger, uh, we also kind of uh, eliminate and uh, illegitimize the uh, experiences of horrible, meaningless suffering that people have by saying, but doesn't it make you a stronger person? I guarantee you people with trauma don't really want to hear that a lot. And so it can, uh, and I think that this kind of frame can make us make more sense of post-traumatic growth. Um, and yeah, you can also apply this frame to uh, just difficult things that happen in your life. The challenges of overcoming a difficult romantic relationship, right? Maybe it was awful, but maybe you grew as a result. Uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, I've already given this away, but the psychedelic state, as I said, has all of those features. So that would definitely qualify. And I got ahead of myself. I was going to reiterate afterwards that these things were all true of that, but I gave you the info anyways. Okay, so another important thing to consider is, well, how do we reason? Do we reason just by logic all of the time, or do we occasionally reason by having hallucinatory experiences talking to burning bushes that don't burn? Well, sometimes this is how wisdom is promoted. And especially in the Jewish tradition, we have a very strong relationship between the visionary kind of experience and um, the proclamations of a person as wise. Um, Moses, of course, is the wisest person in the Jewish tradition. Nobody could be wiser than Moses. And Moses had a series of mystical experiences where he came into contact, a dialectical relationship with the divine, right? So also recall that from Igor Grossman's work, uh, that social situations can facilitate wise reasoning, even if you just tell people to simulate one in their imagination. So what's happening in this kind of experience is that Moses is um, experiencing this dialectical relationship um, with another entity, and that's kind of facilitating the social context that's helping him re reason in a more wise manner. And of course, the Buddha, um, even though the early traditions of Buddhism focused on uh, reducing and eliminating this kind of imaginative content, what is the key feature of his enlightenment experience is his constant temptation by Mara, the demon of temptation, uh, producing either violent, terrifying acts or um, lustful, sensuous kinds of imaginations to tempt him away from the Bodhi tree. And it's by overcoming this imaginative content that he is able to uh, make claims to being a wise person. Now, I alluded to this earlier, but the 
Tibetan Buddhists really went all out on this, and uh, they have a number of practices which involve uh, hallucinating these deities and then absorbing yourself into them to take on their qualities. And so perhaps those are the kinds of experiences that are wisdom promoting, as opposed to just sitting in an armchair and thinking about it all the time. And a important thing that I think to note in the study of uh, mystical experiences and wisdom promoting experiences is that it allows us to make sense of this kind of phenomena. This is self-flagellation. Um, this is the most tame picture I could find on the internet of this. If you look at the term self-flagellation, there are a bunch of terrifying images. Um, <laughs> yeah. Some of these things involve like knives chained to like a set of like three chains and then they'll like hit themselves with knives. Like, so are these wisdom promoting experiences? Well, do they promote growth on those six dimensions? If they do, then we can admit to them in our definitions of wisdom. If not, then maybe we can consider them something else. And one of the reasons why this is important is because in the study of mystical experiences, there is this emphasis on deep and profound positive mood, which I have always criticized just because something isn't positive doesn't mean it's not mystical because people either do terrible things to themselves in the context of producing mystical experiences or the mystical experiences themselves are pretty terrifying and awful, right? Odin, in his attempts to gain wisdom, has to cut out his eye and put it in a well and then hang upside down for a tree, dead for several days, so that he can intuit the structure of the runes. And none of that sounds particularly pleasant, but it does make him a wise person. So just because something isn't pleasant is not a reason for saying that it isn't um, going to produce wisdom. Uh, and currently, our measures of mystical experience do require that it needs to be positive, which I think is just picking and choosing certain aspects of the Christian God that you want to have everybody admit to. And this is a great example, because if you've ever read Revelations, then you know that God is not all sunshine and rainbows. So I'm just going to read this quote from Revelations 9, um, of which this is a picture to emphasize this point. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass or the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but they will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. That's pleasant. Thanks, God. <laughs> and this comes from a mystical experience, right? All this content is a person having a hallucinatory uh, vision. They're channeling content from the divine. And if we, like I said, um, only admit to positive things as being mystical and unitive things as being mystical, well, then we're erasing half of the biblical tradition and, like, half of the world's traditions. But then, of course, we have to talk about more things like mysticism, magic, shamanism, etc. cetera. Um, it's a complicated debate, but um, we need more room for it. Okay, so moving on. Uh, we'll talk about some insights from some of the world's wisdom traditions, Buddhism and Judaism, the ones that are um, very prominent. Uh, and let's see, I'll probably talk for about 20 more minutes and then give you all a break and then we'll come back and finish the rest. So first we're going to talk about Buddhism. Now, Buddhism is super interesting. Um, there's this core teaching of emptiness within Buddhism that makes it really variable and really open to integrating with uh, a variety of different cultures. Uh, so that's why you can have, um, for example, this guy covered in tattoos. Uh, and these style of tattoos are an uptake from the shamanic traditions of uh, Southeast Asia, um, such as in the areas of Cambodia. And they're supposed to be magical seals that give you um, divine powers um, channeled from uh, the Buddha or any of the other various Buddhas. And so Buddhism is split into um, three main schools. There's Theravada, um, which is the original school of Buddhism, uh, Mahayana, and Vajrayana. Vajrayana is the system of Tibet. Uh, features a lot of elements of Tantra, uh, a sort of middle age practice uh, in India that uh, emerged within Hinduism, but that kind of got taken up into uh, Buddhism as well. And then the main argument of that book that I showed in the first slide, um, Sacred Drugs of Buddhism, is basically that um, the initial tantric initiations were just all psychedelic drugs, and that one day, uh, as the tantric, the Hindu tantric traditions were being sort of driven underground at a particular point, uh, they, in order to make alive this uh, tradition, uh, gave these initiations to people who were living in uh, more B Buddhist communities. Uh, and I should have shown a picture too, because um, there is an argument in there that some of the depictions of the Buddha uh, are basically just uh, 
a bunch of instructions for how to find mushrooms. Uh, he's covered in a circle of golden gills, his throat is very blue, his skin is golden, and well, that's a psilocybin mushroom. Okay, so this is a quote from a book that I left in the uh, resource package for this week. Uh, it's called Guide to Dakini Land. Dakini Land is um, this realm of celestial beings that uh, you can meditate upon to gain access into um, your internal Buddha nature and achieve enlightenment. So the author says, sentient beings have many different capacities for spiritual understanding and practice. For this reason, out of his compassion, uh, Buddha Shakyamuni, that's the original Buddha, uh, gave teachings at many levels, just as skillful doctors administer a variety of remedies to treat different types of sick people. Um, so that kind of gets uh, taken up in uh, that Theravadan Mahayana Vajrayana tradition distinction. There are different focuses of each of these, uh, and according to this author, they are just tailored for different people. And uh, different people, depending on their capacities, can search out one or another of these traditions, uh, depending on what best suits them. So Tibetan Buddhism is really interesting. Um, and this is more of a point about how it's interesting. You know, maybe I should have put this at the end, but we'll talk about it now. Anyways. So within the um, tantric Tibetan Buddhism worldview, we have this sort of three-level structure. Uh, so Surrounding everything is um, the world of Dharmakaya. These are like different worlds that become more and more concentrated into particularity as we go into the center. Now, surrounding everything, there is this um, truth of emptiness, of unity, of oneness, and that's this outer realm. Everything is always this pure Buddha nature. <clears throat> now, in Sambhogakaya, here, this second realm, it's called the realm of the celestial deities. Um, this is where particular uh, Buddhas or tantric deities reside. So um, those two images that I showed earlier were of uh, Vajra Yogini and Avalokiteshvara. And so they reside within this realm. They are still immaterial, but they have particularity, whereas this level above does not. It's just continuous, unitive, um, sensuous being. And so the point of interacting with beings in the realm of Sambhogakaya is uh, to use them as gateways to access this fundamental truth of nirvana, nirvana and unity beyond. Um, so they're all kind of gateways into this universal Buddha nature that surrounds the entire uh, of existence. And then Nirmanakaya is this realm of physical emanation. So that's everything that we see here and now, this realm of graspable material reality. Uh, and so this shares features with um, Neoplatonism, which some of you might be familiar with. That's um, a more Western, highly spiritualist view, a revival of Plato's teachings um, that talks about uh, creation happening in a series of emanations out from an initial point of unity, uh, becoming more and more particular as they go out and uh, ultimately coming into this here particular uh, manifest material world. And that's kind of exactly what's happening here. So we're all kind of stuck in Nirmanakaya, this world of physical emanation. Uh, we interact with uh, and meditate on deities that are in the heavenly planes of Samogakaya, and through them we can access nirvana. Now that, as I implied, was jumping ahead a little bit, um, I'm just going to articulate some of the uh, common spiritual paths that um, are found in Buddhism. So for those wishing to attain human happiness, um, the Buddha gave teachings revealing actions, effects, and karma. Uh, moral discipline as a main practice. For those wishing to experience the permanent inner peace of nirvana, uh, they have the teachings of the faults of samsara and training in higher moral disciplines, higher concentration, and higher wisdom. So as we go through these levels, we get more and more complex um, psychotechnologies, practices that will produce wisdom. Finally, for those wishing to attain the ultimate goal of enlightenment, are the developments of great compassion and bodhicitta and the perfections of giving, moral discipline, patience, effort, mental stabilization, and wisdom. And within these uh, categories of uh, moral discipline and mental stabilization, uh, we have these uh, more elaborate visionary practices that I've been talking about, where you um, use this structure of the three worlds to access divine truth via visionary content. All right, so let's run over some of these um, elements of the more uh, common spiritual paths. So the Four Noble Truths, of course, are there is suffering, the cause of suffering is craving, uh, suffering can be stopped, and the way to stop suffering is through the Eightfold Path. Now, this has caused endless problem in the West because, you know, suffering here has a very negative kind of connotation, and it really elicits uh, 
images of pain and people just not doing very well. But the word dukkha, from which we translate suffering, uh, actually is a bit more specific than this. Uh, it just means a state of suboptimal operation. So the word actually refers specifically to a wheel that's kind of bent out of a joint and not really working very well. So if you imagine uh, your shoulder, and right now my shoulder is very well in its joint and it's working well, if it was pushed out of its socket, it might grind against the joint, um, damaging the whole system further as uh, it interacted. Thanks. See ya. Uh, damaging the joint further as I tried to move it. So that's the state of suffering they're referring to, is this um, state of sort of being out of place, out of uh, the optimal flux of things, and uh, as a result of desperately trying to make your way out of this suboptimal pattern of operation, uh, you might end up damaging the system that you exist within even more. And so the Eightfold Path, of course, the way for getting out of this involves um, these factors, right view, seeing things, in as truthful a way as you can, having the right intentions, saying the right thing at the right time, performing the right actions, right livelihood, right effort, right concentration, right mindfulness. Now, the wisdom in this is that it doesn't give you any particular content of wisdom. Rather, it gives you a set of things that, if done correctly, uh, will produce wisdom in any context whatsoever. And the reason that this is wise is because there's no particular content that I could give to any of you that would be generalizable and wise and true in every circumstance, right? You know, sometimes it's usually not right to kill people, but sometimes you need to do that. Sometimes that's the right option. Um, it's usually not right to steal something, but if you're in extreme poverty, then probably it is, because it means more that you live and can contribute to your children than if you just um, submit to the system and die. So. This indicates what's called a process view of wisdom as opposed to a content view of wisdom. Um, a lot of the Greek philosophical traditions are um, working towards kind of a process view. Um, Plato is definitely a little closer, but doesn't really explicitly mention it uh, in as clear a way as he could. Um, could be because he's trying to obscure the truth because it's an insight that you have to have on your own. But uh, especially if you look at Aristotle, he is trying to articulate very concrete things, um, particular virtues that you have um, and particular ways that you'll act in certain contexts that will indicate a wise character. But rather we should, uh, as is reflected in the cognitive science of wisdom, be focusing on a process view as opposed to a content view. Um, so this is a quote from a paper called Relevance, Meaning of the Cognitive Science of Wisdom. This is by uh, John Verveke, who I mentioned earlier, and uh, Leo Ferraro. Uh, and so I'll just read this and then elaborate a little bit. Uh, in coming to understand wisdom, simply knowing the features of wisdom is insufficient. Such an understanding is fundamentally dependent upon our understanding of the processes by which, wisdom, by which someone becomes wiser. So not only do we need to know the processes that are involved in making wise judgments and in behaving wisely and producing the intuition to do the right thing in the right context, uh, we also need to know how we can educate people towards wisdom, the processes that elicit this disposition towards an immediate action that is just that just happens to be the right thing out of all possible things that could be done, right? And so that's why in the Eightfold Path, we don't really specify any particular thing. What is right speech? Well, it depends on the situation. What is right action? Well, it depends on the situation. What's right livelihood? Well, it depends on the situation. And what are the ways to get there? Well, mindfulness meditation, constant philosophical analysis of the processes of one's own thought, all of these kinds of practices. So what is the default? Well, the default is samsara, cyclic existence, being trapped within the water wheel of existence and always reflecting on your life, but uh, never quite being a cause of it, always kind of complaining in the aftermath. So I'm going to read a few quotes from the Tibetan Book of the Dead because it does a very good job of explaining the phenomena. Uh, the Buddhists are great because they're often very clear. Uh, the Christians, not so much. Like being trapped at the edge of a water wheel, um, like I just said, um, so you imagine the water wheel uh, is determined by the motions of things flowing down it and doesn't really have any say in where it's going. We roam alone in cyclic existence driven by deep-seated habitual tendencies. Uh, we roam alone in cyclic existence driven by deep-seated confused perceptions. Um, this one is great. It's from a section called The Plaintive Confessions of Rampant Egohood. Let us stray by the momentum of my mistaken past actions and improper past behavior. I have mistaken the path and become lost on the path. I regret with powerful remorse the negative past actions I have committed of any kind. Drawn by the momentum of momentary yet violently resonant past acts, I have sunken into an ocean of suffering, the sea of cyclic existence. And of course, in the center of the sea of 
cyclic existence. Um, it's hard to see there, but there's like a rooster and a snake uh, and a pig. And this, sep this represents greed, delusion, and aversion, the primary ways by which cyclic existence uh, manifests and continues in our world of everyday experience. And so what's also really important here is the constant emphasis on past actions and the resonant effects of past actions, right? Because my responses here and now are the results of a long process of learning. The reason that I am here standing in a particular kind of way, making particular kinds of hand motions, having a particular kind of perspective, are all informed by the context in which I have developed and the history that I've experienced. And the particular things that cause me to suffer in life are also a result of things that have uh, are either my own doing or have been done to me, right? And this is true of everybody. We are all holding on to a lot of content that is something far beyond ourselves. The actions of our ancestors are in a very real way being reincarnated in our flesh by informing our attachment patterns as we learn to attach to our caregivers and how reliable or not they may be. That imprints and informs us uh, and determines our perceptions in the future. And these are called samskaras, these um, complexes that are built up as a result of constant learning across time. Uh, they form, uh, basically, they are quite literally complexes in this um, sort of Jungian sense, uh, these networks of associations and memories that will determine and influence our actions across time. That's what's being referred to in this notion of samsara. Now, there is a further complication that comes into this, though, because um, well, this comes from uh, the philosopher Nagarjuna. He was writing around 150 to 250 Common Era. Uh, he's a primary uh, example of uh, Mahayana philosophy, uh, and a very good one. Uh, he writes in poetry a lot. I posted the um, reading from which this comes. It's very short, um, and that's the name of it above. So if you're interested in looking at the whole context, um, it's online for you. So he says, nothing of samsara is different from nirvana. Nothing of nirvana is different from samsara. That which is the limit of nirvana is also the limit of samsara. There is not the slightest difference between the two. OK, well, that's interesting. How can liberation and uh, bondage be the same? That which, and well, this is why. So that which taken as causal or dependent is the process of being born and passing on, taken non-causally and beyond all dependence, declared to be nirvana. So it's all about agency. The primary notion here is agency. Are you a cause of nature or are you caused by nature? Are you determined completely by your context, only ever reflecting and looking back at what has happened to you, saying, why has this happened? Why am I suffering constantly? Or have you differentiated yourself from this deterministic flux and situated yourself such that when you choose to act, you are, in fact, causing your social contexts and thereby changing the path of cyclic existence uh, towards something more whole, more uh, free from suffering. And the important thing is that all of the stuff of the world is always the same, regardless of whether or not you're manifesting the aspect of samsara or nirvana. These are sort of mirror images of precisely the same stuff of the world. Uh, it's just how is that situated? What is the relationship between cause and effect? And if you, as an individual, are only ever an effect of your world, well, that tends towards suffering, as it says in the Noble Truths. All right, so to some psychology. So Albert Bandura, um, he's a good social psychologist. He's been studying the phenomena of agencies, wrote a bunch of good papers on it. I think I also uploaded this one to the drive, but I can't remember. Um, so he says, to be an agent is to influence intentionally one's functioning and life circumstances. In this view, personal influence is part of the causal structure. People are self-organizing, proactive, self-regulating, and self-reflecting. They are not simply onlookers of their behavior. They are contributors to their life circumstances, not just products of them. Now, the Buddhists would probably admit that this is a lot more difficult than Albert Bandura would let on, and that even if you are in a state of material well-being, you might still be entirely determined by the context that you exist within. And so even if you are manifesting what I'm going to point out are the psychological qualities involved in agency, uh, you might still be trapped in this uh, endless wheel of existence. And perhaps even if you don't know it, uh, you might be contributing to the suffering of other people. You know, Perhaps the wealthy business person in a capitalist society uh, could be ruining life for a lot of people, even though he is fully capable of all the capacities of agency that we're going to talk about. And um, so with the more metaphysical analysis of the Buddhists, uh, we don't really get to say that just because an individual has a particular set of capacities that they are free. Uh, rather, they have to be living ethically and wisely as well. So there's a much higher standard for agency 
Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there's useful parallels to draw between these. So the things that make one an agent, uh, according to Albert Bandura, are intentionality, forethought, self-reactiveness, self-reflectiveness. And so I'll just elaborate a little bit on those. So intentionality refers to uh, being able to form intentions, uh, such as action plans, being able to set out strategies for realizing them. Um, he does admit that there's no absolute agency because obviously we have to coordinate with other people uh, and collective endeavors are required uh, in dealing with the problems of social life. Forethought involves the temporal extension of agency, so uh, through cognitive representation, visualizing futures, using mental imagery, uh, thinking ahead, uh, you can bring future goals in line uh, with your present behaviors and um, use anticipatory self-guidance to uh, bring out a set of goals, uh, pulling into being an unrealized future state. Uh, three is self-reactiveness that uh, rests on us being uh, self-regulators, we can regulate our emotions, of course. We're not only determined uh, by the emotional responses that we have, but we can dampen or expand those depending on how they're useful. And we can construct appropriate courses of action uh, and use motivation to regulate um, ourselves and the execution of action. Uh, Self-reflectiveness -refle also super important because uh, it allows us to reflect on our personal e efficacy, the soundness of our thoughts and actions. It allows us to um, determine if we're doing well or if we're not and to make objective more or less claims about our own self-efficacy and to change ourselves if we are not doing well. Okay, so some of you have seen this next slide a million times by this point. So this is the default mode network. And the reason that this has been of particular interest is because um, this network is very highly dominant in a lot of conditions of psychological suffering. So uh, that might be depression, that features high dominance of this network. Um, end of life anxiety also feels, uh, also experiences, or sorry, features overactivity of this network. Uh, and these are conditions, of course, that have been uh, treated with the use of psychedelic compounds that are normally resistant to the treatment with other things. And, well, what do tryptamine psychedelics do? Psilocybin, LSD, DMT. Well, as a result of activation at the 5-HT2A receptor, uh, which is highly densely located in each of these nodes of the brain, uh, it kind of deactivates these networks. It disperses them, uh, and so frees you up from uh, this default way of seeing things. The reason it's called the default mode network is because when you're just at rest, it's what's active. Uh, it's sort of your re resting ready state from which you respond to the world. And I'm just going to yeah, refresh a few points because um, they're important. So normally this network is inversely correlated with task positive networks, meaning that when um, you're focused on some task in the world, then um, this is something that your brain is supposed to break out of, and then you visit other network spaces that are more apt to solving certain problems. And if this network is dominant all of the time, well, it's going to impair your capacity to solve problems well and further to break out of particular kinds of emotional states. It will very, uh, in a very real way, sort of grip into your brain and keep you locked into a constant state of uh, dissatisfaction, of suffering, of dukkha. Now, there's a notion that's very important uh, called parasitic processing, and it basically uh, bridges the gap between our sort of more philosophical analysis of agency and samsara with this more neurological analysis, uh, and uh, even I think it helps us to integrate the psychological level of things as well. So this is what uh, parasitic processing looks like. I hope, I know that's kind of blurry. Um, I hope you guys can see it from the back. Is that really hard to see? Yes, okay. I did leave this paper in the um, drive as well. So I'll just read some of these for you. Okay, so this is how it happens. So first you have an event that's interpreted as wrong or bad. Uh, you have an emotional assessment of the probability of future events um, as being similar to that. Um, that's called the representative heuristic and the availability heuristic. It's very easy for you to think that things will always be the same. Um, that interacts with this notion called encoding specificity, which is that um, when you're in a particular emotion, you're more likely to recall emotions that are uh, encoded in the same state. Uh, this, in combination with that availability heuristic, um, the ease of access for um, a similar future as a result of this initial bad instance, uh, produces the confirmation bias, which then gives us a presumed likelihood of similar events, anxiety results. Anxiety is an emotion that narrows your frame of reference to more specific local processing, right, which is the inverse of what we expect from wise reasoning. It makes you more focused on concrete details um, and, you know, 
It just basically sucks them into your brain as things that you're worried about. Uh, you get a loss of cognitive flexibility, a sense of not being able to solve a problem, low self-assessment, low self, um, low sense of being effectual. Uh, this makes you feel frustrated and futile. You feel, oh, well, hell, this will just always be the same. You have a very fatalistic outcome. Uh, that might lead to paranoia about that, and then you're interpreting events as bad or wrong again, and then so this just um, self-organizes and just becomes this um, cyclic sort of process that drags you down into negative states. And it's very much how uh, thinking in depression, anxiety, conditions of that kind uh, is characterized. You have all of these things that narrow down your focus and that sort of feed into uh, the way that you are uh, processing, uh, such that you know, if you're in a negative state, then everything seems uh, infused with this sort of negative essence, and that uh, propels you in this sort of negative downward spiral. And that's very, very hard to break out. Hi, welcome. This is Ivan. Okay, so this um, will kind of sum this up. Um, yeah, come on, have a seat. Just two minutes, I'm on break from the class. Okay. Um, so this will just kind of recap in a bit of a more concise way what I've said. Um, various construals, biases, and factors of cognitive processing, such as encoding specificity, can all powerfully reinforce one another, such that a complex, compulsive, because of positive feedback, and resilient, resistant, self-organizing system can take shape within one's cognition. It's a system that warps our sense of reality and robs life from us. Ironically, the very things that enable intelligence and makes us adaptive, that is complex self-organization, is also what makes us vulnerable to foolishness. Okay, what is in that idea? The same thing that makes us intelligent, that makes us agents, makes us foolish. Nirvana and samsara are the same thing. It's basically that idea. The exact qualities of our cognition, its capacity to organize frames on its own without any higher order oversight, is precisely that which also makes us foolish and drags us down into suffering. So the problem is, how do we get this machinery to be freed up from these maladaptive, self-perpetuating machines of suffering, and how do we redistribute that processing into uh, more productive areas that can liberate us, as opposed to constantly making us suffering as a result of our own self-generated biases informed by our history? Well. That sounds like a good place to take a break and return to in about 10 minutes. We were at parasitic processing. Uh, that's where we left off. And so how do we uh, resituate these patterns of our mind that are an intrinsic quality of cognition, this capacity for uh, our minds to self-organize, to develop patterns? Uh, because we can't really not do that if we didn't develop regular, reliable patterns. Well, then we wouldn't be able to generalize any of our processing, and we wouldn't really be able to develop coherent personalities. Um, so it's adaptive that we have this system of uh, pattern generation and of self-organizing pattern generation, but it can rob our agency of us by uh, fixating on the wrong things and by being sort of miscoordinated from uh, any ideals of what's optimal for us. Because at the level of our neural processes, uh, they don't really know what's going on out here in the larger world of things, and so uh, everything is locked into these automatic processes and left without intervention, right? Uh, life will tend towards suffering. That's just kind of the default. So we got to kind of get in there and uh, optimize things where we can. So we talked about uh, this model last time uh, of the mind, where we have uh, the basic computations that our neurons are doing constituting the autonomous mind. The algorithmic mind are these um, sort of more large scale uh, patterns of processing, uh, such as like facial depth, facial recognition, or um, being able to do mathematical computations. And then we also have the reflective mind, um, which is our disposition to sort of intervene in our own processing, to look back on ourselves uh, and to override automatic dispositions in processing uh, and to initiate a alternative. Now, what makes us irrational and what locks us into self-perpetuating problems is uh, an incapacity for the rash rational reflective mind to interact with the algorithmic mind, right? There are many cases we can think of where you can see the uh, alternative thing to do, uh, but you go ahead and reiterate the same pattern that you know will lead you to suffer anyways, right? Uh, addiction is a very common kind of example of that. You know you shouldn't have that drink, but you do it anyways. You know you shouldn't stay in bed scrolling Instagram or Facebook for an hour, but you do it anyways. Um, so what's going on there, and how can we enhance that? Well, one way that we can massively transform this uh, system is uh, through the use of psychedelics, which, like I said, uh, kind of dissolve the 
certain higher order networks, such as the default mode network, um, which are a kind of neural representation of these autonomous self-perpetuating patterns, these self-perpetuating modes of interpreting the world. And uh, it allows for your neural system to differentiate, learn more about the overall space of possibilities that are accessible via various neural pathways, uh, and to settle in on and learn more optimal configurations for processing in the future. Now, psychedelics aren't the only way to do that, of course. We have um, the capacity to learn different ways of interfacing with our cognition. And uh, Stanovich, from who this model comes um, in his book, What Intelligence Tests Miss, he talks about mindware, which are rules, knowledge, uh, procedures, strategies that a person can retrieve from their memory uh, to aid decision making and problem solving. So for example, you could use Bayesian, prob prob uh, Bayesian probability theory to enhance your capacity to consider alternatives and uh, reason more effectively about um, how probable an event is. But you also have um, a bit of a more thorough distinction made uh, by Verbeke and Ferraro. So uh, this quote comes from that paper for that uh, parasitic processing model comes from. Uh, one becomes liberated from this pattern not by willfully acting when one is in a state of dissatisfaction, but by appropriating their own development and learning how to commune with their future flourishing self. So with the mindware example, um, that indicates that perhaps uh, it's useful to, when we notice something maladaptive forming in our mind, uh, apply some method in that moment to intervene in that uh, onsetting maladaptive state. <clears throat> and so that's the pro approach of, uh, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy. You're attending to your mind as it's making certain processes, and you try to replace that uh, with a more adaptive process. But that isn't always that uh, effective. So psychotechnologies uh, refer to this set of practices that kind of prepare you in advance to have better initial judgments, right? So mindfulness is one such psychotechnology that uh, will practice your capacity to notice when your mind is wandering and to be able to keep it on track more. Uh, and there are many more elaborate kinds of psychotechnologies. Um, like I mentioned, these deity visualization things where you try to imagine the qualities of particular deities very clearly and then take them on. Um, there's any number of them that I could go on about, but um, I just want to talk about um, them in the abstract and we'll flesh out some specifics a bit later. Um, but the importance here is that um, you take time out of the day to uh, implement a technology of mind to fundamentally transform your mind uh, such that in the future it can be more reliable uh, in forming initial judgments or in uh, helping you to initiate this override pattern uh, that can help intervene in parasitic processing. Now, an interesting thing about this too is that by using different psychotechnologies, by internalizing different ways of operating your mind more or less, you can also increase the efficacy of things like the psychedelic state. So for example, um, in the second week, uh, we talked about this a bit and we'll talk about this more today. Uh, if you memorize a symbolic system, that symbolic system can be redeployed when you're in the context of a visionary experience, right? If you have read the Bible thoroughly and you're very familiar with the symbol systems of Christianity or of Buddhism, then when you are in the context of this dreamlike psychedelic experience, your memory will reiterate those things uh, to allow you to elucidate implicit information between that, that exists within that symbol system uh, that maybe you just don't have access to but is latent within the symbol system itself. And so that's uh, a kind of technology that you can internalize. You can internalize these symbolic languages that enable you to gain more effective insights from your own mind. And that brings us to the question of exactly how we reason, right? Because Stanovich talks about reasoning um, very much in this logical, rational way. But reasoning isn't always reducible to formal logic, as it's often considered to be. So first, I will um, flesh out how Keith Stanovich thinks about this, then we'll uh, elaborate. So algorithmic level cognitive capacity is needed in order to uh, override and uh, to simulate activities um, you need to have this capacity in order to uh, be able to generate alternatives. If you don't have uh, a particular um, particularly competent level of cognition, then, well, um, you are more or less constrained to automaticity. Uh, the reflective mind must be characterized by the tendency to initiate the override of suboptimal responses generated by the autonomous mind and to initiate simulation activities that will result in better compromise. And lastly, the mindware that allows for computation or that allows the computation of rational responses needs to be available and accessible 
during simulation activities. Um, so again, you need to be able to learn things in advance that you can utilize uh, in the moment uh, to better facilitate your capacity to reason. Because unfortunately, you can't really intervene in parasitic processing as it happens. Um, it's very nature is to rob your agency of you and to persist in its uh, activity. And it will be very, very resilient to your attempts to override it, um, right? Um, so from my own experience, when I was very, very depressed very long ago, I had this hope that, actually this wasn't very long ago, um, but anyways, uh, I had this thought that, well, you know, at least when I'm in my lowest, I will always come out of it, there will always be something better that will happen, and you know, it's just temporary, I just have to ride it out. And then one day I realized to my horror that if I'm always going to come out of the state, that means I'm always going to return to it, and things will always be a horrific plunge back into eternal darkness. And that was terrifying, because with that thought went my hope. And yeah, that's very difficult to intervene in and to get yourself out of. So what are some of the strategies that you can do to intervene in that and to try to um, pull your mind away from using its resources against you? Well, mindfulness meditation is the one that is the rage right now. It's thrown at every problem. You have mindfulness everything. If you do everything mindfully, it will get better. It's the end-all be-all for every cure. And so how does mindfulness meditation work? Well, it's not really about getting a completely blank state of mind. Now, if you try to just blank out your cognition, you're going to become very, very frustrated very quickly because it's not going to work. The monkey mind will act up. So what you do is you attend to a single point of focus, and when you notice yourself becoming distracted, as you inevitably will, you just label it. You say distraction, mind wandering, um, thought, narrative, memory, whatever's happening, and then you bring it back to that initial point of focus. But how do you bring it back? Well, it's kind of like training a puppy. This is the example um, that uh, my professor, John Verbeke, uses all the time. Uh, you can't train a puppy by being overtly aggressive with it because then it will try to fight back against you. If you try to drag it violently back to center, it will pull back. Um, but if you just like whisper to it, would you please return? Would you please do this trick? Well, it'll just run away and not really do anything. So you have to um, take the middle path. Of course, right? As um, is always the case in Buddhism, the middle path is the one that is most often correct. So you just gently return it back to center, um, just as though you would um, you know, bring your puppy to heel as you're training it to walk beside you. And slowly over time, um, your mind becomes more and more ready and willing to do this, and you can sustain these bouts of attention for longer and longer. But what's important about this is developing the skill of being able to pull your attention when it starts to go, right? So you can generalize that skill. You can take it with you elsewhere. Um, so for example, uh, if you're reading and you're very distractible, mindfulness meditation might be very good because you can notice earlier when you're becoming distracted and bring your mind back on track. And yeah, so an interesting preface before I go to the next slide. Um, in teaching people mindfulness meditation, it's often emphasized that for any content that you get, if you get mental imagery, if you get any feelings, any sensations, just ignore it. It's a distraction on the way to enlightenment. It's just your mind trying to distract you. It's Mara providing you with some um, illusory content. And all you have to do is just wait and wait and wait, and eventually that distraction will go away. And well, that's a perspective that you could take. But that is the one major criticism that I have against um, especially the earlier forms of Buddhism. Uh, Vajrayana, or Tibetan Buddhism, uh, they quickly were like, no, actually, the imagination is super important and fundamentally transformative. Uh, but the earlier forms of Buddhism were like, no, don't engage at all. But this brings us to the question, again, how do we reason? And that brings us to this wonderful occult interlude. So I'm going to read this uh, quote from Aleister Crowley's book on tarot, uh, and then we will elaborate the implications of this. Um, so this has to do with our tarot character, the fool. The great fool is a definite doctrine. The world is always looking for a savior. The doctrine in question is philosophically more than a doctrine. It's a plain fact. Salvation, whatever salvation may mean, is not to be obtained on any reasonable terms. Reason is an impasse. Reason is damnation. Only madness, divine madness, offers an issue. The law of the Lord Chancellor will not serve. The lawgiver may be an epileptic camel driver like Muhammad, a megalomaniac provincial upstart like Napoleon, or even an exile three parts learned, one part crazy, an attic dweller in Soho like Karl Marx. There is only one thing in common among such persons. They are all mad, that is, inspired. Nearly all primitive people possess this tradition in at least a deluded form. They respect that wandering lunatic, for it may be that he is a messenger of the Most High. That queer stranger, let us entreat him kindly. 
it may be that we entertain an angel unawares. Okay, so this gets at something that I've sort of alluded to um, previously. Um, and the idea basically is that the fundamental element of your cognition is your imagination. Uh, rational, reflective, linguistic reasoning is a development. It's a, something that comes very late in your processing. And what is more ingrained into your motivational and emotional processing is your imagination, because it's running simulations of whole scenarios, of whole situations, that much more readily activate emotional tones which can drive uh, the transformation of cognitive processes. If you just think rationally, I need to do X, um, that's not really going to produce the motivation. It might kind of supervene on the motivation, but the primary function of reason is to uh, elaborate on and make more clear impressions that are fundamentally non-linguistic. And depression, for example, has been called a disease of reasons. And people who are depressed are more prone to rigid analytical thinking. Uh, you might have seen articles claiming that people who are depressed see the world more realistically. Um, and what that really means is that they're just focused on this more concrete way of looking at the world, of looking at particularities um, in a very uh, analytical, rigid sense. And you know, within that kind of worldview, there is this uh, eminent or imminent nihilism, where in the scientific cosmos, of course, nothing really means anything. It's all just things bumping around chaotically, and there's no meaningfulness in that at all. And well, that's, of course, a very depressed way to think. Um, it's very difficult to exist within a world where there is no meaning. And that kind of analytical, uh, reductive mindset is exactly the opposite, again, of what we see being characteristic of wisdom, right? That we need uh, bigger picture thinking, more emotional complexity in our thinking. And that is what is associated with being able to reason in a wise manner. So, the fool. What is the fool? Well, the fool is a character who doesn't really know where he's going, but he doesn't care. That's why he's stepping off of this cliff, he has his eyes closed, he's looking to the sun, and he's just doing whatever he wants. Uh, going blissfully ahead in spite of, or b it because of, the uncertainty of his circumstance. And I have a tarot deck which was made by a contemporary of Aleister Crowley. It's called the um, Hermetic Tarot. And for this particular deck, you're supposed to order it such that uh, all of the major arcana are in order from zero to about 21 in um, the top of the deck. And then you have um, the suits below it, the minor arcana. And so the Fool, of course, is on top. And as you shuffle the deck, this represents the Fool's fall through the infinite permutations that uh, the deck can represent. And so you, as the reader, uh, are effectively the fool, not really knowing the future and trying to draw the future out of um, this array of cards that you're laying down for yourself. And so depending on how the fool falls, he becomes a variety of different characters. And the one who has control over reality is the magician. The one who holds the stick of power that can generate an effect, that can cause, that has agency over otherwise deterministic materialistic world um, is the magician. And that's interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, because how does the magician do his thing? How does the magician operate? Well, it's certainly not by doing um, mathematical proofs, or at least it's not all of the time. But any good magician uh, is, of course, versed in many things. The uh, realm of magic, as a friend of mine has said, is the province of bored geniuses. And if you look at Faust, for example, uh, when Faust decides to summon Mephistopheles, uh, it's just because he's studied every subject that he can, and he's just kind of bored and dissatisfied with the world, and so he's like, ah, oh, hell, I'll just try my hand at magic and see what happens. So you do need to have a very sort of well-rounded knowledge base, a lot of internalized cognitive systems and uh, symbolic systems in order to effectively engage in existence as the magician. But the magician also fundamentally makes use of the imagination. He knows that he doesn't really know um, what the true nature of the divine is, but he knows that there are a number of uh, garments upon the face of God, so to speak, that he can apply that will enable his cognition to grasp more readily uh, the structures of transformation in the world and to employ them in a meaningful, deliberate, and directed way. Right? So he stands in a circle and he summons a demon and he interfaces with this thing and says, go do this work for me in the world. And is he successful in actually manifesting what we might call a personified entity? Well, no. We'll actually look at exactly what a demon might be when we talk about Judaism. But all of the things that the magician uh, does is uh, the, he basically makes use of a set of uh, interesting psychotechnologies that play on imagination and the social cognitive reasoning systems that are so fundamental to human cognition. And he utilizes those to direct his intentionality and to make reality move in accordance with his will. And so sometimes the more rational thing to do is not to just analyze things and to uh, reduce everything to logical forms and logical propositions, because that kind of way of looking at the world very quickly reduces it of meaning and turns it into a formal system that could just as well be anything else, so long as the patterns are uh, the same. 
Uh, how we reason fundamentally is through our imagination, through narrative. And again, let's recall Igor Grossman's claim that by even getting someone to simulate in their imagination a social context, they can uh, more regularly produce wise reasoning, right? So the difference between Moses and the difference between the magician is that the magician is deliberately trying to alter his consciousness such that he can produce the kinds of states that lead Moses to the wisdom that he has. Whereas Moses and the other prophets are just waiting for God to plant it in their brain. They're waiting for him to plant revelation. And so it's the difference between receiving and producing. And well, I think there's a good argument to be made to appropriate our own cognition to produce the kinds of experiences that lead us to be more wise. Okay, so all of that being said, um, the reason that's a good interlude here is because, well, Tantra, the uncommon spiritual paths, uh, are basically the paths of the magician. And it's not uncommon in Tibet to find uh, disenfranchised sorcerers who have left their practice uh, to go be um, magicians in the woods, and they're uh, hired by the people to um, appease demons and deities and uh, perform curses and all of that kind of thing. Uh, very common around these uh, areas where Tantric Buddhism is very, very prominent. And so within Tantra, um, you have to be given a tantric empowerment. So usually someone has to initiate you into a particular practice uh, in order to plant the seeds of realization in you. Um, and those are usually associated with some uh, deity or another. Interestingly, you know, I've already mentioned that um, in that book, Secret Drugs of Buddhism, uh, psychedelics may have been uh, precisely the initiation that those teachers got. And so it might be meaningful to say that psychedelics could be seen as tantric empowerments, but perhaps only under very constrained circumstances. Because as I also mentioned, um, psychedelic mystical experiences and insights can be as pathological as they are enlightening. So drawing that boundary is perhaps a bit difficult at times. Um, so the four classes of tantra are as follows. Uh, the first is Kriya Tantra, which involves external action and ritual purification. Charya Tantra, which is conduct and the internal cultivation of samadhi. Samadhi is like single pointed focus, this unitive sort of oneness. Uh, yoga Tantra, which emphasizes inner yogic meditation upon reality. And highest Yoga Tantra, which involves external unity with a generated image. Um, in Western sources, you might find this. Uh, under the name of assuming the God form. And so basically what you're doing is you're trying to uh, take on and transmute your sense of self to accord with the ideals of one or another deity. You might play the persona of Shiva for a while. You might uh, play the persona of, um, who else is good? Um, oh, it's, why is it, my brain right now is, Kali. that's it, Kali. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Um, any other number of deities, they all have a particular set of qualities and traits that you can sort of uh, wear on your personality uh, and absorb to um, be something more like that thing which is greater than yourself. Now, an interesting thing that I'd like to point out here is the relationship uh, between these stages, right? Because um, as I emphasized a lot in the second week and as I've uh, mentioned in passing, uh, perhaps a bit more than passing today, uh, the cultivation of samadhi uh, indicates that the experience of oneness, of unity, is actually just a preparatory stage to do more complicated and more interesting things. So we shouldn't be stopping our research at the unit of experience, because sure, that's something that happens very immediately if you do enough psychedelics, and everybody will have that experience. That's great. But it's very hard to act on that experience, because it's fundamentally an experience of um, too much to be able to put into words. And it's really difficult to meaningfully act on something that you can't see. <clears throat> And so what we talked about in week two is that what's useful about the unitive experience, that feeling of oneness, is that it initiates the pathway in your brain that is involved in insight. And so you're kind of rehearsing the capacity for your brain to insightfully transform your frame and to reformulate how you're seeing the world. And so that can be really useful for shattering parasitic processing, breaking you out of it and enabling you to formulate new ways of seeing the world. But if you want to continue developing on the path of self-cultivation with mystical experiences, once you've developed that capacity, then you need to scaffold it with other uh, more interesting practices, such as those as assuming the God form of one or another deity that can help you internalize traits that you maybe don't have access to already, such as loving kindness, compassion, well-being, um, powerful will, etc. So just to reiterate on the conclusions here, how do we reason? Well, as imagination is the foundation of thought, and um, that's fundamentally how our cognition works. Language and literacy does enable us to do abstract formal reasoning, and that can be 
uh, advantageous in a number of ways, but it's not always advantageous in helping us to transform our own thinking sufficiently to make us live a better life. Interestingly, the simulation of images and social situation can allow for the application of inferential potential that the kind of abstract reasoning that is characteristic of language-based processing can't, right? So if I abstract a set of natural processes as characters um, and I have them interact in a dialogue, the way that these people are going to interact is going to be much more diff different than if I just thought about those concepts as um, logical propositions. That's what's meant by inferential potential. There's a different potential for, potential, uh, for reasoning about things depending on how you clothe them. Uh, so for example, I could think of the Holy Trinity either as just abstract processes or I can think of them as actual people and see uh, what the consequences are if I get these people to interact. Uh, to integrate the reflective, algorithmic, and autonomous levels of the mind, mental imagery and imagination is more profoundly effective because it's more integrated with emotional and motivational processes, um, which are in fact the seat of your quick, intuitive, autonomous, and algorithmic processes. So by using mental imagery-based practices, you can actually intervene in the machinery uh, that your earlier levels of processing are built on. And so, for example, if we take Vajrayogini and we are to initiate a practice with her, this isn't literally what Vajrayogini looks like, right? It's fundamentally an immaterial celestial force, which is a gateway into something that is fundamentally um, liberated from any particular form. But the red skin, for example, represents control, the yogic fire of transformation. She's looking upwards, which represents her looking to the pure Dakini land, symbolizing her enlightenment. The curved dagger symbolizes the cutting of attachments, protection from lower spiritual forces and black magic. She's standing on a man's heart and head, indicating the crushing of ignorance and hatred. And she's standing on the breast of a female, indicating the transformation of desire. The skulls are her defeating death, as this is one of her powers. All of these are representations, metaphors, visual metaphors of concepts that um, we can use to internalize and to feel the truth of as opposed to just proposing. Okay, and that brings us to the end of that. Now we'll talk about Judaism. So Jewish philosophy, all right, we gotta set the metaphysics for this one. Um, it's very important to understand the basic, the basics. And so what's the opening part of the Torah. Well, the book of Genesis, of course. And he says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So this is used very poorly by a lot of people who don't think about theology that well to, for example, say that, well, God is a sky man and there's this entity beyond the sky that sits on a literal throne who intervenes directly in the affairs of individuals and that only male and female phenotypes are admitted into the world and gay marriage is terrible. Uh, but that's not what any of that means. To say that man is um, made in the image of God means that uh, people are a microcosm, which uh, means, according to Gershom Sholem, who is this um, philosopher and scholar of Kabbalah, the more mystical uh, tradition of Judaism, uh, that the world is wholly contained and reflected in man. And so the word that is used for image uh, in Hebrew is zalem, which is applied to the notion in virtue of which a thing is constituted as a substance and becomes what it is. And so that notion of becoming what a thing is is very important because we are, in the, we are a likeness of God, not in looking like God, but in being constituted by the same creative powers by which God generated the cosmos. So it's in virtue of being in the likeness of this creative force that we are in the image of God. And if you think that God is a sky man, then Moses Maimonides, a 12th century philosopher, wrote the guide for the perplexed, particularly to those people who are perplexed in his view. Um, God is fundamentally immaterial, so how could it have a body? That would detract from his infinity. Okay, so I mentioned demon summoning, but like what is a demon and what, on the flip side, is an angel? According to Moses Maimonides, all natural and psychic forces are angels. Uh, angels are essentially immaterial, so apprehending them in any corporeal form is always a function of the imagination. Um, for Maimonides, uh, gravity is an angel, and any time there is a single cause, um, that same angel presides over that. So, um, you know, gravity, the electromagnetic force, those are angels, uh, just in the same way that birth is an angel, death is an angel. Uh, anytime something dies, it's presided over by um, Samael, the angel of death. Uh, and 
So daemons, of course, uh, just comes from the word uh, daimon in Greek, which uh, was initially used to refer to uh, lesser deities, deities that don't live on Mount Olympus. And interestingly, according to Plato, uh, you can become a demon if you just philosophy hard enough. Um, that's one of the ways that you become eternal is by the uh, creative processes of your psyche becoming independent of your flesh and continuing to instantiate an effect even after your corporeal form has uh, died. And so in me talking about Plato, and particularly that way, I am resurrecting a part of the process of his psyche and keeping him alive uh, in our community. And so that's very much what's meant uh, by the notion of eternal life, for example. Um, so there's lots of disagreement about that, but that's one of the common ways of seeing it. And so this also refers to the notion of um, complexes that we touched upon when talking about samsara. Because each of the processes in your mind are also an angel, right? So your ego is a particular angel. Um, and all of the processes that we can say that's one particular process and that's another particular process, um, these are all also sort of angels in the mind. And as we are in the image of God, what that means is that there is a hierarchy and natural order for all of the processes within our mind to take. And that the oneness of God needs to kind of have dominance over that. And um, all of the angels within our psychic process hierarchy need to be uh, ordered such that none of them are revolting and causing havoc. So that is very much in accordance with Jung's model of the self. And of course, Jung was very interested in the Judeo-Christian uh, systems. And so his model of the self looks something like this. Uh, you have a whole bunch of abstract subcomponents of your mind. Uh, the persona, which is what you present to the world, the ego, uh, the shadow, which is all of the things about yourself that you don't really want to accept and acknowledge. We all have in us an image of male and female, just like God in the animus and anima. Uh, and then we have a number of archetypes, right, that are characteristic of different kinds of um, ways of thinking and ways of being. So I'm just going to read you this. I think this is from a paper I wrote, actually, which is why I didn't cite it. Um, when the competing drives, desires, and complexes of the psyche are all subsumed within the structure of the inner Yahweh, when there are no rebel angels, then one comes fully into the image of God. From this perfected mode of being, wisdom is possible. But wisdom disconnected from macrocosmic mind of God is, as Solomon will state in Ecclesiastes, meaningless. So the process of um, psychotherapy and the process of um, coming into being an agent uh, is the process of making sure all of your uh, the angels in your mind are uh, well-ordered, well-integrated, such that there's none of them... Uh, self-deceiving and causing you to um, promote maladaptive behaviors. Uh, and then interestingly, um, I was listening to the sermons of Meister Eckhart, who is a, a Christian mystic also from the 12th century. And he was saying that um, as soon as you sin, you become in the likeness of the devil, because um, if you're not like God, well, then you're like um, the opposite of it. And that's kind of like the shadow. You kind of become the shadow of this um, potential that you have. So this is a quote from uh, Ecclesiastes, which is actually great. Um, it's one of the more enjoyable books, at least for me, in the Bible. Uh, and it's allegedly written by Solomon, though a lot of this stuff is uncertain. Uh, Solomon was the uh, so-called wisest king, greatest king of uh, the ancient Jewish world. And he was said to have been born with the gift of wisdom. He actually asked God for other faculties, such as um, the strength of good rule and uh, intelligence. But God was like, well, you get a lot of wisdom. That's what you get. And Solomon's an interesting character because at the beginning of his rule, everything is going very well. And he is very strictly adhering to Torah. And as a result of his adherence of wisdom to Torah, he makes uh, ancient Israel more prosperous than it's ever been. And they have massive amounts of gold and trade relations and everything super successful. But later on, uh, he begins to diverge from Torah and uh, he allows uh, his many wives to worship their gods. And so there's idol worship going on in ancient Israel. And he becomes less and less connected to the rule of Torah. And the books wherein Solomon's a character emphasize that he's always just as wise as he's ever been. But when his wisdom is divergent from the law, then um, he also causes havoc and the ruination of his kingdom. So again, here we have this same kind of idea that um, the faculty that can promote liberation also promotes bondage and suffering. So let's see what he has to say about wisdom. Look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much wisdom and knowledge. 
Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly, but I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. So Maimonides has a huge section about this, um, and I did leave his book, The Guide to the Perplexed, as a PDF in that, of that in uh, the documents that are available from this. So uh, if you want to read it, it's in there. I've included, for the most part, um, page citations, not for this one, but for the next parts I did. So it's all around the latter half of the book. So the attribute hakam, wise, is given to a person that possesses great intellectual faculties or good moral discipline or skill in art, but also to persons cunning in evil deeds and principles. So that's interesting because if you have this capacity for, um, well, for creating something out of nothing, effectively, that's what the process of wisdom allows us to do, right? We saw that quote at the beginning from Proverbs that um, the Lord created out of um, the power of wisdom. Uh, if you can generate any kind of scenario as a result of how wise you are, how insightful you are, how you can cut up reality in any number of ways, uh, you can also do great harm to people. You can really see how people can be hurt, and you can really, in a cunning way, destroy them more effectively uh, than you could if you didn't have that capacity. And the word for wisdom in Hebrew um, denotes four different things. It doesn't just denote wisdom on its own. Uh, it denotes the knowledge of those truths which lead to the knowledge of God, any knowledge or of any... Uh, workmanship, so um, you can be a wise spin spinstress, or you can be um, a wise mechanic, or you can be you know, wise in that you are excellent in a particular domain. Here again, we see emanations of, um, or intimations of uh, Balt's view that wisdom can be considered an expert knowledge system. It also refers to the acquisition of moral principles, but also cunning and subtlety. So being very clever, being insightful, right? The fox is kind of an archetype of this um, cunning sort of wisdom. Now, what happens when we do effectively tether our personal wisdom to the wisdom emanating forth from God? Well, uh, according to Maimonides, the individual becomes a conduit for providence. And of course, providence refers to uh, the capacity for God to intervene in affairs in daily life. And so if we connect our personal wisdom to this macrocosmic uh, divine wisdom coming from God, then we become a conduit through which the power of God can transmute the world. In the study and adherence to law, microcosm is connected to macrocosm and justice is ushered into the world. Uh, Maimonides says, providence watches over every rational being in accordance with the amount of intellect with, uh, which that being possesses. Those are perfect in their perception of God whose mind is never separated from him. Enjoy always the influence of providence. But those who perfect in their knowledge of God turn their mind away from God, enjoy the presence of divine providence only when they meditate upon God. When their thoughts are engaged in other matters, providence departs from them. So this seems to put a much heavier burden on connecting one to the powers which liberate one from the otherwise deterministic forces uh, of the world. And so this is one of the psychotechnologies that Maimonides prescribes for connecting to God, is you just meditate on this divine name forever, 24 hours a day. You are never to leave this out of your mind. I tried doing this for a few days. It's very complicated. It's very hard to like go about your daily activities and to have this in your head for more than like 10 minutes before getting distracted. And then we go, yeah, okay, hold on. Let me generate that image again. And so within uh, Judaism and the more mystical trends of it specifically, the Hebrew language uh, is a intrinsically magical language, right? Because God speaks language into existence. He orders existence out of the words of the Hebrew language. Um, and so there is a particular causal power that's associated with each of the letters of the Hebrew language. So if you're really going for it, you do need to know what the Hebrew letters mean. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, if you want to try this, you can just uh, concentrate on the English version. And then what you're basically doing um, is you, as you're constantly meditating on this, you are condensing every association that you have with God into this small symbol such that you can hold the symbol into your mind and it acts as um, a memory gate into everything that you could possibly think about God. So it's kind of cool. As you meditate on these symbols, you can condense information into them. Um, it's called chunking in psychology. Uh, and so you can make, through the use of these symbols, um, very efficient ways of holding information into your head. And that's basically what's going on in this kind of practice, is that um, as you're reading Torah, going through the practices of adhering to Jewish law, et cetera, et cetera, all of that content is becoming condensed in this, such that as you hold this in your mind at all times, it's acting as this point through which you can access everything that you've learned from the tradition. Mm -hmm. 
So Maimonides goes on to say that the perfection in which man can truly glory is attained by him when he has acquired, as far as is possible for man, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of his providence, and the manner in which it influences his creatures in their production and continued existence. Having acquired this knowledge, he will then be determined always to seek loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness, and thus to imitate the ways of God. Right? So even your actions are brought into being in this image of God. You become more like him. You become more benevolent, etc. Now, there's a super important part um, about the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, which also has major implications for understanding the psychedelic experiences that people often have. And that's the notion of the fear of God and um, also how that relates to intellectual humility. Which, as we saw, was one of the key points in um, the wise reasoning construct. So here's a few examples um, from the book of Proverbs, which is, of course, um, so the book of Proverbs is very cool because it personifies wisdom as this um, motherly woman standing on the edge of town, uh, basically telling people how to keep order in the town. Uh, and so these are some of her prescriptions. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear God and depart from evil. He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. Um, so yeah, we've got to be afraid a little bit and um, be humble. OK, so this fear of God concept is really interesting for a number of reasons. Um, so I was in a class on wisdom last year. And one of the projects that we had to do was this project called Living Wisely. And so you pick a tradition, and you live according to it for a few weeks, and you write down your experiences, and then you give a presentation to the class and um, write what you learned. And there was this um, woman in class, and she was one of these very interesting, like, pious Chinese Christians who was like, you know, even though I've been going to church for uh, every week all the time and I'm working on this personal workbook to get closer to my faith, I still feel that I've been, like, going astray and I really need to, like, get back on track. And she specifically mentioned this notion of the fear of God, and she was like, I've been having trouble making sense of that. So I went to my priest and I asked him, you know, how do we make sense of the fear of God? And um, I think the answer was something like, oh, well, uh, it doesn't really mean fear per se. It just means that you have to have awe of God. And, well, there's a grain of truth in that, but you really do need to fear God for a lot of good reasons. And so those reasons have to do with the inconceivability of God. Um, it is, in fact, wise to fear the thing that you can't understand because it will destroy you unnecessarily at the least expected time. We'll go into that in a second. Um, but from ecclesiasts again, um, Let's read this, which is interestingly a bit of a contradiction from what Maimonides says. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned. But time and chance happen to them all. So that's a contradiction in that Maimonides says that if you are meditating on God and cultivate perfection, um, then God will watch over you and protect you. But here, uh, Solomon saying that, well, actually, chance rules over everything. It doesn't really matter what you do, who you are, what you're going for, and you know what your context is. Um, chance reigns, and that's the end of the story. So let's look at a really good example of why we need to fear God. OK, so how does God solve his problems? OK, so this is from the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah is one of the prophets. Um, this is from the uh, vision that Isaiah has at the beginning of the book. And uh, so the context of this is that the people of Jerusalem are um, falling further into sin, straying from God. This is the aftermath of uh, Solomon not really effectively managing his kingdom. Um, there's a huge point made about women wearing too much jewelry and how much God hates that. Um, you know, people are adulterous, they're worshiping false idols and all of this. And so uh, he appears to Isaiah and says the following regarding how we need to clean up town. Uh, he said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the hearts of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I, Isaiah, said, for how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remain in the land, it will again be laid to waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Okay, genocide. That's how we do it. They could be transformed, right? 
Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. They have the possibility for redemption. But God's message to his prophet is prevent that. Do not allow them to transform because I need to make an example of them. I need to kill 90% of them. Once they are all destroyed and their land ravaged and they are elsewhere, then they can begin again. That is how the God of the Hebrew Bible solves his problems. And further, what he does is just to make a point that everyone is his pawn. Um, so what he does is he sends the king of Babylon out um, to ravage the kingdom. And then the king of Babylon's like, haha, I'm high and mighty. Um, I'm, look at me, I'm so powerful. I've defeated Jerusalem, this mighty nation. Um, then he makes a point to smite that king anyways, just to show that he was his pawn all along and nobody really escapes the wrath of God. So there you go. So there is an important lesson in this, right? And the point is that this is really hard to comprehend. The point is that you can't conceive of this. It is far too large for any rational, coherent structure that you could create to integrate this into. And if you can make sense of that, if you can be OK with that, if you can internalize this and make sense of it, then there is something profound and powerful that you initiate in your psyche as a result of being able to cope with uncertainty, right? Because coping with uncertainty is one of those key fundamental points that we see in every single model of wisdom that we've looked at. And it's also in more that we haven't looked at. And so. This notion about incorporating something incomprehensible into our cognitive structures is actually very important about the notion of awe, right? So there is a fundamental relationship between fear and awe, but we can't get rid of the part of fear. I think that we need to still um, acknowledge and respect the fearful aspects, uh, even though awe is kind of the uh, upper reach of the emotion of fear as well. So this comes from a paper called Awe, a putative mechanism underlying the effects of classic psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. and so. Basically, the argument is that, well, psychedelics promote a lot of awe, and that helps us to sort of reframe our uh, perceptions and to cope with uncertainty, right? So perhaps to enable our uh, per perceptions to become uh, something a little more like those we consider to be wise. So awe is an emotion in the upper reaches of pleasure and on the boundary of fear, experienced in the face of two key appraisals. One is vastness. Any stimulus perceived as much larger, larger than the self, including physical objects, loud sounds, shaking ground, or markers of social status, such as fame or authority. Imagine being starstruck or standing in awe at the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and of course, what is more vast than God? Because God is an abstract representation of everything that ever is, has been, could be, in the processes by which they can or can't be. That is a vast concept. Accommodation is the second part of awe, and accommodation is what enables you to transform fear into awe. Accommodation is the need to adjust mental structures so as to integrate a new experience, sometimes involving fear, disorientation, and even ego dissolution, also known as ego death, and subsequent rebirth, as well as um, enlightenment when mental structures adapt to assimilate new information. So if you can achieve this act of accommodation, then you transform fear into awe, and um, it also has this um, very real cognitive process that you initiate of being able to readjust your uh, initial frames uh, to encompass and encounter um, in a coherent way, uh, something that previously was completely incomprehensible to you. And so the point of the technology of the God concept is that it's always incomprehensible. There's always further to develop. There's always further to go. There's always further you can take it. And so that's why it's so useful, because it's always transcendent. As you develop and grow, there's always more to grow and develop beyond. So uh, talk a little bit about Kabbalah, because that really gets us into mystical territory. Um, so within Kabbalah, wisdom is, uh, in its psychological aspect, pure thought, which has not yet been broken up into differentiated ideas. Wisdom is the level above all division where everything is simple unity. So it's kind of like that potential from which all can come. And the structure here, the tree of life, um, this is how you, or this articulates the process of creation where um, maximal uncertainty, um, called Ein Sof, or the infinite, uh, exists above this structure. And then as it trickles down through this structure, um, it emanates and manifests into a more particular concrete way. So if you recall that three spherical structure of the worlds of um, the tantric Buddhist view, uh, this structure would mediate the relationship between each of the layers, such that um, this relational structure would um, guide how creation becomes more particular as it uh, emanates forth into the world of particular material reality. Uh, and if you're interested, the pattern that that happens by is called the lightning bolt. So it starts at one, it goes to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, so on. And then the process of the mystic is to travel each of these um, 
lines, which represents one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, and there's uh, implicit information in each of these, right? So this contains, um, this is also in a more Western esoteric occult practice called the glyph of attainment. Um, so it means that as you practice it, you attain insights that are contained latent within this image. Uh, and you do that, there's a different insight and um, set of relations for each of the uh, paths based on the letter. And then once you do that, you apparently unlock magical mystical powers and you can create golems and all this. And one of the fundamental experiences that the Kabbalistic mystics are aimed at is producing prophetic revelations. Um, this and a tradition called Merkava mysticism, uh, which is a bit earlier than the tradition of Kabbalah. Kabbalah originated around the 12th century, uh, involves following prophets like Ezekiel or Elijah and uh, trying to produce visions of God uh, in order to apprehend him more clearly. And so, of course, prophecy and the prophetic experience is something that is very much like the experiences that people are getting under the influence of psychedelic compounds, especially DMT, which is particularly strong and prone to producing um, very visionary landscapes. So, I referenced a book at the beginning of this called DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, where uh, Rick Strassman, who is one of the people who started researching psychedelics after a few decades of that being not okay, um, he wrote a book saying that, well, it seems as though Hebrew prophecy is kind of the ideal way for understanding uh, how people are experiencing psychedelics. And he draws on the philosophy of Maimonides to provide um, a bit of a rough frame for um, the argument that he's making, which is that prophecy is much more like the psychedelic experience than um, the unitive experience alone. So um, this is Maimonides on the notion of prophecy. So he says that, the, um, this is the view of what he calls the philosophers, um, which is different from the view that he holds, but me being a philosopher, hold this view. And so I'm gonna emphasize this one and just outline the difference after. So the philosophers hold that prophecy is a certain faculty of man in a state of perfection, which can only be obtained by study. Although the faculty is common to the whole race, um, namely the imaginative faculty, it is not fully developed in each individual. This is the case with every faculty common to a class. It is only brought to a state of perfection in some individuals and not all. If a person perfect in his intellectual and moral faculties and also perfect as far as possible in his imaginative faculties prepares, he must become a prophet. For prophecy is a natural faculty of man. It is impossible that a man who has the capacity for prophecy should prepare himself for it without attaining it, just as it's impossible that a person with a healthy constitution should be fell well and yet not properly assimilate his food. Okay, cool. So as we talked about imagination and visionary content as a form of abstract reasoning where we are using symbolic metaphors that draw inferential potential from the domains of social cognitive reasoning uh, and other kinds of areas, um, that's basically the same sort of thing. Every piece of content in a vision is a visual metaphor through which abstract ideas are being rendered more intelligible to you. Um, these are ideas that are sort of just on the brink of your capacity to articulate linguistically. And so because they aren't very clear to you yet, your mind is producing them to you in the only way that it knows how, which is through this more fundamental way of reasoning with imagination. And so this happens to you in dreams, right? You get a bunch of weird content in dreams and it doesn't mean nothing. Uh, you just don't maybe know what it means yet, but it's revealing significant content to you. And similarly, when you're in the um, influence of the psychedelic state, what is happening is that your mind um, is particularly open to talking to different regions that it never talks to. Um, the boundaries between functional networks in your brain kind of break down, and so uh, your visual area can interact with many more areas of your brain, and we actually have brain imaging studies that show us that this is the case. Uh, your visual system can translate information from other parts of your mind uh, into a visual metaphor to a higher degree than it can under normal circumstances, and so your capacity to do this imaginative rendering of content is markedly enhanced, and if you're not paying attention to the meanings of particular kinds of stimulus, uh, you're just gonna miss that whole aspect of the state. And so that brings us to this psychotechnology, or rather set of psychotechnologies that I like to call imaginative personification, uh, which we might subtitle rendering your psychic angels. And so this is a way that you can approach engagement with the psychedelic state um, to make it more effective. So imagine ent agents, entities, situations, etc., act as a mental object that integrates implicit memory stores uh, associated with one or another complex. And so implicit memory is a kind of memory that is fundamentally um, unconscious. It's not strongly enough represented in your neurons to be something you could refer to and articulate. Um, but nonetheless, it informs your action. People are very good at informing implicit judgments about things. Um, this is the foundation of our intuition. Uh, and so for example, things like um, our 
tendency to develop attachment patterns. It's not something that we can really clearly refer to because it's based on very low order parts of our nervous system uh, that motivate us to approach or be distant from certain people. Uh, and because it's so basic and um, heavily entrenched in like subcortical areas, um, it's something that motivates, or it, it transforms our motivation and our uh, relationships to people, but it's not something that is uh, the content of analytical reasoning. And it's very difficult to transform attachment patterns with analytical reasoning alone. So through the representation of an attachment pattern, for example, with um, what you're doing is you are making inherently unconscious information uh, more intelligible and readily accessible by synthesizing that content uh, through an imagined agent. So for example, uh, you could imagine the entity um, Apollo, let's use Apollo, it's a classic one, uh, and that will bring into consciousness all of the information which is associated with the personality of that particular character. Um, let's say we have the archetype of the devouring mother, right? That could be something that's really messing up your attachment. Um, <laughs> That's something that um, by imagining and interacting with, uh, you can make more clear to your mind, right? Um, as opposed to it just being maintained in your lower order motivational um, approach or uh, avoidance systems. And what this is also doing, for example, if you do meditate on and engage with a particular agent or entity in your imagination, it simulates a social context where you can enter into a dialectical relationship with the imagined being. And you'll find that if you do this, you'll very quickly get legitimate responses um, from things within you. Uh, and you can actually transform the content that would otherwise be inherently unconscious as a result of it being maintained in your implicit memory stores. Uh, and you can more readily enact agency on it and bring it into awareness. And I've emphasized this point 100 times already. I'm sure you get it. So uh, there's a cognitive scientist. Her name is Jean Knox. Um, she talks a lot about transference and working models, right? So transference is the uh, phenomenon in psychology where you um, apply to somebody else a pattern that you have developed from uh, somebody back in your history, right? So very commonly in the therapeutic relationship, uh, you might have uh, the patient uh, projecting their experience with their mother uh, onto a uh, female therapist, and so they might become all of a sudden very afraid of that person for uh, apparently no reason, but because you're activating the set of implicit memories within them as you're going through the content of their experiences. Uh, internal working models, um, these uh, internal representations that we have of the people that we interact with, are uh, implicit unconscious maps for accumulated experience of past relationships with key attachment figures that we draw on to anticipate and understand new human encounters and relationships. So we're always kind of doing this. We're always using our past experiences to inform our interpretations of other people, right? But if you developed in a really fucked up environment, then the way that you're doing that is very bad, and it's going to lead you to be mistrustful of people. It's going to lead you to all sorts of havoc, right? Um, and yeah, so this, this process of transference um, arises out of the internalization of actual people and real events in the world and gradually produces an unconscious pattern of generalized expectations about relationships. And so if you do have a very poor learning environment where um, the feedback is not very clear about what is a good thing to do and what is not a good thing to do, um, this makes your internal working models very confused. And um, as they are based on fundamentally implicit forms of processing, uh, bringing them into consciousness by these uh, imaginative personifications um, interacting in an active imagination with an entity, or even, for example, using the empty chair technique in Gestalt therapy, where you just um, talk to a chair as though that person is actually there, that helps you to act on those implicit patterns by bringing them into consciousness um, through the use of an imagined, an imagined interaction with them. And so this is an important link um, that we can draw from Gene Knox's theories and the work on wisdom. So according to this paper in 2014, wisdom manifests in how people reflect on their past experiences, right? Are we open about them? Um, do we acknowledge that people are doing the best that they can? Do we recognize uncertainty? All of those elements we talked about. Uh, and the psychoanalyst's task, um, Jean Knox says in her book, Memories, Fantasies, and Archetypes, uh, is to construct new internal working models of relationships with our patients. Uh, analysis creates new implicit patterns of interpersonal relationships. For Jungians, this synthetic or constructive function of analysis is very familiar because Jung himself proposed that the aim of the constructive method, therefore, is to elicit from the unconscious product a meaning that relates to the subject's future attitude. So in the therapeutic interaction, 
Um, whether you're talking about it, maybe you're using this empty chair technique, or maybe you're doing active imagination, maybe you're even doing an embodied ritual where you're trying to focus on a particular deity that seems to be very strong within you, like Mars or Apollo. Um, those could be drawing on these implicit memory stores that you have, and you are changing the way that you're reflecting on these uh, implicit memory stores and the memories that you have regarding the people who informed them uh, through rendering these complexes intelligible to you uh, via the imagination in some way or another. And there's many more methods to doing that than the ones that I've mentioned. So by reducing transference through resolving attachment complexes with imaginative personification, implicit and explicit structures may be reorganized. Uh, this means that the way an individual relates to those memories changes, and an interesting consequence of this is that by developing an internal symbol system through which your unconscious can become conscious, uh, there is an increase in the coherence of dreams and other experiences that can come along with that, right? So as you work with this internal mythology that you construct for yourself, even if it's perhaps very um, realistically based on the people that are in your life, you know, some people are better at abstracting than others, so it might be good to um, focus more on like generating and interacting with actual people as opposed to um, gods and angels and such, but um, however you're doing it, uh, as you engage in this process, you will increase the coherency and the clarity <coughs> of visionary content, uh, and that applies not only to your dreams, but to psychedelic experiences as well. So there's a scaffolded relationship that you get as you're um, increasing your internal coherency and your capacity to engage with images. You can increase the efficacy of the psychedelic experience, which may otherwise uh, plateau if you're not doing these deliberate methods for transforming your memory in your mind. And on that note of transforming memory, um, this paper from 2018 uh, about psychedelics and their therapeutic possibilities uh, specifically mentions that enhanced memory retrieval uh, can provide the opportunity to rewrite aberrant and unwanted memories. Uh, intrusive memories are characteristic of, or of PTSD, for example, uh, so you can work with those. Substance use disorders are associated with maladaptive memories that direct attention to drug-related as opposed to natural reward. Um, so perhaps some of the effects that we're seeing from psychedelic therapies are a result of this um, eliciting uh, implicit <coughs> memory stores into consciousness, working with them, uh, integrating them, transforming them. And of course, uh, we were talking about Jung, so we should quote him at some point. Uh, Jung stated unequivocally that in the process of symbol transformation, of symbol, symbol formation, the union of conscious and unconscious content is consummated. Out of this union emerges new situations and new conscious attitudes. I have therefore called the union of opposites the transcendent function. So this act of using the imagination as a tool for thinking about your experiences and transforming them is basically activating the transcendent function. This great picture is also a great album, by the way, by the Devin Townsend Project called Transcendence, and it seemed to fit perfectly well here. So this just emphasizes the points I've been making. Unconscious complexes that play in your psyche can be interacted with by rendering them conscious with mental Im imagery. A stern and distant father may be rendered as Zeus or Thor. The impact of a difficult romantic relationship may be rendered as a siren, etc. So... Your imagination is powerful. Use it, don't ignore it. But what else do the wisdom traditions of the world offer us? Well, they can give us guidelines for the instantiation of relational modes of sense making to contribute to the coherency of messages obtained by the use of psychedelics such that they then afford wisdom instead of illusion. Okay, what does that mean? Well, if we look at something like mudras, for example, um, what are those doing? As we meditate on holding our hands in particular kinds of ways and the ideas that come with them, um, we provide a embodied context cue for particular um, ideas that uh, mean when we later, after instantiating the relationship, this association between position and uh, state of mind, um, we can re-access those states of mind more readily by providing the context cue of that embodied posture. And so if you're going through a system of learning yoga, for example, or meditation that uses mudras, um, you can enhance your capacity to kind of catapult into the states that these sorts of mudras indicate. Um, because you become very, very sensitive to context within the psychedelic state. You become very sensitive to very minor perturbations in environment. And this can be one of them, especially if you've done the practice ahead of time of um, instantiating these relations in your body, right? And the way that neurons learn is fundamentally relational. Things that fire together, wire together. That's the classic saying. And you can really initiate a very fine-grained kind of control over that. Um, for example, there was a study done by, um, I think her name was Cecilia Hayes? I, sh I forget. Uh, that might be it. She wrote a book called uh, Cognitive Gadgets. 
And um, she did an experiment which um, showed how easy it is for uh, mirror neurons to relearn and how association is the fundamental uh, mechanism on which mirror neurons will learn. And so she had um, a person, they tied electrodes to the hands of one person and they had them watch a person like moving their index finger. And they found that there was a slight electrical impulse that would um, cascade on the same finger uh, in the person that was watching the behavior being performed. But if you go through a series of training and you get, for example, that person to move their pinky finger as they're watching a person move their index finger, then when you redo the experiment and measure the electrical impulses as they're only watching, then that transforms and now their pinky finger initiates the electrical impulse. So you can very quickly change and contribute to the learning of these associational relational um, systems in your body. And this is one of the ways you can do it. Um, I thought I added a picture here of the chakra system, but um, that's also a really powerful way that you can do that. So the chakra system is kind of built off of these um, places that we generally tend to have uh, feelings in our bodies, right? And we begin just by having these very murky sort of um, intimations of feelings. We're not really sure where they are or what they are. But as we concentrate on a system of concrete orbs in particular areas along our spine, uh, which of course is integrating information from our body and sending it up to our brain, we're creating a much clearer system to be able to interpret our emotions um, by instantiating this system of relations in our cognition. It makes more clear our access to interoceptive states and emotional states. Uh, and it's not something that's pre-given, it's not an innate thing, but it's a thing that we can learn into ourselves to make clearer our understandings of our, our bodies and our emotions. And so all of that can interact really profoundly if you also um, integrate psychedelics into your process of learning and cultivating these uh, ways of operating your body. Oh, yes, I did put it here. Okay, there it is. Um, right, of course I put it here. Um, so wisdom traditions also offer these structures through which to scaffold interpretation and insight. Rituals, words, and movements can facilitate insights and interventions into the self. And as a part of intellectual humility, um, the magician, for example, knows that the world is incomprehensible. He knows that he doesn't really know what he's talking about. Um, but he does know that if he uses symbols and if he works his mind and body in a particular kind of way, that he can massively expand his power over himself. So it's not really about admitting to the ontological truth of these things. We don't need to say that demons literally exist. We don't even need to say that God literally exists. To admit to the fact that when we interface these concepts and ways of being uh, with our cognition, they can promote massive transformations and perhaps they are more appropriate as ways to think than just focusing on logical analysis because these kinds of ways of being, of uh, this sort of ritualistic, <coughs> embodied, um, intuitive kind of uh, way of existing um, can help us hone our approach to the world, right? The problem with the analytical reductive scientific view is that it annihilates all meaning. There's the problem of infinite interpretations. What of all possible things is correct? It doesn't really give us a value system. There's this all pervasive thing called the meaning crisis that people like to talk about because there's no pre-given meaning within the worldviews that we have. How do we solve that problem? Well, maybe it's by taking a more playful approach to reality. Yeah. And that's it. from uh, strict adherence to Torah, but he was still considered wise in that. It's just that his wisdom was not um, yoked to Torah, which uh, connects into the wisdom coming from God. Well, wouldn't that indicate that he was, he was, uh, well, if he was wise, right, and then he started to allow his wives to have more personal freedom, isn't that a product of his wisdom? Wasn't his wisdom allowing him to, you know, yeah, you, you, I have no right to tell you who to worship. You should worship the gods of your family and your ancestors. So Isn't what, that an indication of wisdom? What became the problem was that um, he became less strict in his adherence to like uh, the rituals that God would demand and the sacrifices to him. He became accused by God of idol worship himself and by promoting um, social corruption. And I think that there might have been an explicit law against 
uh, having idols worshipped in Jerusalem specifically. So like it's fine for other people to do it outside of the walls, but like not in God's temple. Well, yeah. So they're not literally God, like the high priests of the temple probably didn't allow him to be. So he, in a practical sense, Solomon was becoming more religiously tolerant based off of his edu self-education. Yeah, monotheists hate that. But being tolerant of other people's religions. There is one true religion, it's Christianity, and nobody else gets to say anyone else's idol worshippers. They killed so many people on this ground. Yeah, I was just reading this book on Zoroastrianism, and it was like, Zoroastrianism is so old that you can't really, you've never seen it in a position of dominant power. And so there was this text that was discovered of Zoroastrians at a time when they were in a position of power, and Christianity was still a cult, right? And so they were literally getting pissed off at uh, the Christians for burying their dead. It was, oh yeah, so the, um, the Zoroastrians were uh, oppressing Armenian Christians, and the Armenians refused to not uh, worship Zoroastrian gods, and they were Christians, right? And they literally said that uh, they pollute the earth by burying their bodies. And so the concept that the, the corpse is toxic is just like, what? No, it goes back into the earth. So like, if your religious system or system of belief is not in line with the natural order of the universe, the dead feed, you know, feed the living, right? So things go back into the earth. Burial is just a natural thing. So if your religious system doesn't promote logical union with natural law, then it's just ridiculous. So it's just like, and it's, it just creates conflict, right? So, I think so, the idea that what if Solomon was getting wiser in that he was becoming more tolerant, more uh, humane, uh, and then there was a limit to that wisdom, and then the priests suppressed that. Because once, <coughs> once your wisdom overcomes identity, or like cultural identity, then it's no longer, it's, then it's dangerous. That's very possible. Yeah. That's a pretty good ar argument, actually. Yeah. I mean, obviously, polytheists, the Romans were more tolerant than the Christians. Yeah, they, totally the game, for sure. Polytheists will let anyone really adhere to any faith they want and any god, to any semi god, to any god, whatever. Yeah, so maybe Judaism didn't tolerate any versions, right? Yeah, definitely at least for the Jewish people. Because right. um, there is the idea, too, that like they are the chosen people, and so they are the ones that have to adhere to the laws. So as long as there's like the laws of Noah, and as long as people are um, transgressing those, um, then there's no necessary damnation for them. Uh, but yeah, that kind of strict adherence and the power of the priestly class in mediating that could have very well been um, a factor. There's, yeah, that's like a whole huge thing. That's a, that's a very <coughs> large thing for analysis. Uh, but very typically, there is a kind of hubris that comes along with any religion that says that we have the one ultimate truth and this is the actual thing and the other things are just um, degradations of this. So I would agree with you that, especially from our standards, Solomon may have been seen as being more wise and sort of punished for that, but um, the value relativism, you know, to constrict the other frame. I was just trying to like, draw out what was useful in the Jewish frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Yeah, so it's basically the foundation of your thought. So uh, mental imagery is like the grounds of the imagination. Uh, mental imagery involves your capacity to um, simulate perceptual properties, to utilize them uh, for cognition, right? So that could be something like uh, mutating a shape. Like if I'm trying to imagine how is this chair going to fit best in this room, and I move around in my head, that's something that I'm doing with my imagination. Uh, so don't we need like that part of our intellect to think about the past and to project ourselves? Yes. It helps us to simulate possibilities for the future and to um, generate memory. Uh, it seems that creation mythology as well. Yeah, definitely. We use all Harari's books, Sapiens, to create that space. And so the symbolic aspect of the imagination, um, what's happening there is that you're 
condensing information in a much more efficient way than if I was to speak it. So the purpose of language, for example, uh, is to be very refined and to eliminate a bunch of interpretations so that I can provide you a particular one. But there is a kind of ambiguity that's uh, present in images, right? Because as we have all heard, an image speaks a thousand words. And so that um, ambiguity of interpretation uh, allows for sort of more degrees of freedom in uh, utilizing an image in uh, reasoning as opposed to um, language. So you have that trade-off where the imagination and imagery uh, sort of makes more efficient the uh, condensation of information into a particular unit, uh, whereas <coughs> language is much less efficient but much more refined in articulating one or another particular thing. Where that would apply is that you want to, for example, put a lot of images in your set, because you never know what you're going to gravitate towards and what will scaffold you into an insight. I was hoping you would talk a little bit more about the integration phase when it comes to the psychedelic state. So I do you've had a mystical experience of some sort of integrating that when you come back down, just some of the practices that are normally used with the integration phase because of how extremely important that is when you're going about your daily life to be able to integrate all of these mystical experiences back into your normal daily life. Yeah, so journaling is number one, um, writing it out a lot, um, maybe going on a bout of ecstatic writing after you finish your journey. Um, some people are better at more of an art therapy kind of approach, so like um, getting down a visual representation of things that you've experienced. Uh, usually, um, so there are actually psychedelic integration groups that you can find. The Toronto Psychedelic Society does run them pretty regularly, um, at least once a month, I think, if not twice a month. Um, so those are held at a place called Alternity, and uh, they're often run by somebody who has experience in psychotherapy. So that's definitely a good place to go. Um, finding a psychotherapist that does have uh, experience dealing with psychedelic integration is a great thing to do. Um, what else? Yeah, actually, so one thing that like comes from the practice of mysticism uh, is that generally it's advised that you don't really talk openly about your insights and intuitions, right? People have this tendency to be like, oh, I'm filled with meaning, and I need to tell everyone about the particular things that I experienced. But going through the process of just being able to sit with those insights and realizing that like, they are insights for you uh, is a practice in intellectual humility and can help you also to not get too excited in such a way that you speak too soon about things you've realized. Um, Yes. <laughs> On that note, how do you, how does that relate to the dialect, dialectic thinking? Like, how do you balance? Because I think I'm speaking personally, like I do, uh, really create dialogue in terms of like being able to process ideas. If I don't understand an idea on my own, I like to discuss it with another person. I find that that like the idea that dialectical thinking was a was a dialogue. Is so can you talk, like, how do you balance that? Yeah, so in When is it appropriate to not share? In mystical traditions, you basically only talk um, with your guru about these kinds of things. Um, and it's more about... Why? Sort of, oh, well, because... What will happen if I tell a stranger? They just won't get it. Or they'll fill you with their opinions. And, and isn't that <coughs> why <coughs> that adds to it? It depends on who you can use your intuitions for that. Um, I violate the guru all the time. Um, I'm yeah, just saying yeah. it is a thing that people do. Um, and I think it's good to be wary about uh, how open you are and with who. But you can have a select inner circle, right? So you could consider these the initiates into your mind and people that you trust. Um, but you know, there is also the archetype of the uh, psychedelic proselyte who uh, wants to proclaim his revelation to everyone. And that is perhaps the thing that we're trying to avoid as opposed to not ever talking about it. It may also dilute your full effect as well. I mean, uh, you know, people at ayahuasca, uh, you know, that's one of the things I say is abstain from uh, head eating, abstain from sex afterwards, don't dilute the, the effect of the experience of the ceremony. Yeah, I think that is part of it too, like sitting with it, containing with it, waiting to internalize its effect before talking about it. This is kind of uh, like taking it back to the song story. Like, uh, can you elaborate? 
you know, taking taking uh, yourself outside of that container of wisdom, which <coughs> Paul had with with God, um, it, it diverted, and you get what I'm saying. I think it's the blind spot for me. I don't know, the concept of diluting an experience. I mean, like. I feel like dialogue can only be an additive experience. Like, if, I, if you don't get it, then I know. Like, say I have this revelation, right? I have a psychedelic experience, and I tell you, and then you give me a weird look, like you don't get what I'm saying. That only motivates me to refine my communication skills. Why would it, what would be the problem with learning that I need to work harder? So I think we need to account for social roles here as well. Your hardness and some of your function is to confuse people on occasion and to, you know, um, yeah, so I think that like maybe that's part of where the blind spot is coming from. It's just that your mode of being is more um, in accordance with um, being open about um, yummy and transformational kinds of things. But maybe like the businessman who's having psychedelic experiences on the side uh, can't quite do that and have that conversation as often, right? It's not as um, socially appropriate for him in his circumstance, right? Um, like professors few who have psychedelic experiences never talk about them. Um, one person who gave a lecture at a conference um, in Toronto a while ago was asked about his uh, psychedelic experiences, and his response was, that's like asking somebody about their experiences with sex, right? That's like the most intimate thing that you could possibly ask me. They're just expecting me to bear my soul here to you. Is that what, you're not, you're not supposed to ask people about their sexual experiences? <laughs> For, so, you know, it's all about the social relations involved, right? So being mindful of the context and the roles and all that. There's a time and place for everything, right? It's the idea of that <laughs> I've been making people laugh like this. <laughs> On that same topic of you're talking about professors who don't share their psychedelic experiences, what are your opinions on Timothy Leary? Because recently I've heard a lot of diverging opinions on Timothy Leary. We have some people obviously praising him for what he's brought to the community, but as well as really criticizing how open he was and kind of the attention, the negative attention he brought to, to what he was doing and how that changed and in your mind, just your overall opinion of where he's taken things in his legacy. Just whether it was for the betterment of the psychedelic community or if it, he kind of knows, uh, talked to yeah. some people who say he kind of set things back by half a century with uh, alerting people a little, a little too soon and setting off a bit of hysteria around the topic. So I think that there's a lot of levels of analysis in this question, and I'm definitely not like a Leary scholar. Um, I really haven't read anything that he's written. Um, but it is my take that it seems as though he is the kind of person that went a little bit too far too quickly, mm -hmm. but that the social circumstances were such that the government is really, really looking hard for the kind of person to throw everything at, and so to completely put all of the blame on his shoulders is just wrong. Because the CIA was already looking for somebody to make this argument they had prepared, right? You know, like it was just gonna happen. They hated the hippies, they wanted control over the war in Vietnam and to suppress a particular population. So it was clearly the government. Um, but yeah, um, I think he didn't help uh, by being too excited too quickly. And there are other people who could have done that, right? There are spiritual teachers who maybe he could have worked with that could have played that role. Uh, and the person at the top of one of the highest Ivy League schools in uh, America does unfortunately need to have a bit of a conservative role. And that's kind of really how professors are uh, approaching their academics, usually um, for better or for worse. There's the phenomenon of people who are very conservative until they get tenure and then go off the rails. Um, see Jordan Peterson. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, He's a rock star now. A little bit, <clears throat> yeah. He's a bit unhinged, I think, at the moment. But yeah, Leary also became unhinged, but um, I wouldn't say the whole setback of the psychedelics was his right. fault. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think he was a scapegoat. Definitely. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was unfortunate timing. Uh, you know, counterculture, he was, the, he was the target. But he was also a bit sensationalist. And mm -hmm. some of his early research, it was all flawed. You know, he was taking That's acid, it. the subjects were taking acid. Yeah, you it was know, also a doctor. The results so. were clouded. Mm -hmm. So he didn't do. Yeah, he could have done a better job. Could, yeah, he could have done a better job. I watched this video about explaining uh, the archetype of Slytherin in Harry Potter. And apparently, like, based off that, it's like they're highly uh, focused on strategizing or strategic thinking. 
which is planning ahead, being realistic. It's like if I need to succeed in this world, I have to, I have to be combative and play by the rules, or break the rules, or bend the rules. That's the only way. People who don't do that um, uh, get crushed by it, right? So Jordan Peterson really feels like he embodies that Slytherin type. I feel like with his success, like when he was a professor, he was grounded by his love of Jungian stuff. He was serving another idea, but now it's Jordan Peterson for Jordan Peterson's sake. He's like. He's strategizing to strategize yes. to strategize. I love that I now get to say this on record. Jordan Peterson is his own definition of the devil. Unbridled rationality that falls in love with its own ideas. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He is not, yeah, he is not integrating the shadow at all. No, he nailed it on self. Yeah, I know he did. Like, he just like says this clearly, and it's like, you realize that you are just projecting yourself, right? You are a Luciferian archetype. How do you not see that? Yeah. That's really interesting because he looks like him. It's with the suits and the, and the greased back hair and the sharp face. Completely. Like he so thoroughly embodies it. It's so funny that he plays the Christian thing so hard. And really, why does he do that? It's to manipulate people that he thinks are too stupid to think for themselves. Oh. Yeah. For example. Like a Right, right, definitely. Which sounds silly, but I mean, like, if we're working with symbolism, right? Slytherins are a type that are, have a function in a, in a narrative. And so uh, it sounds like childish to like quote a, a fantasy novel, but they have a purpose that re is reflective of the real world. So if this whole, this whole class is about uh, using symbols to express experiences, right? So if I say something is Slytherin-like, that they're, then what does that mean? That means that uh, Slytherins represent a certain type of experience and choice and behavior and personality. Yep. And if you experience that kind of thing in a psychedelic experience, now you can say, oh, I have to get in touch. I'm repressing my strategic thinking and stuff like that. So that, that's what you're, it's good to be thinking like that? Yeah, definitely. There's lots of value in uh, drawing metaphors. <coughs> kind of on the other side of like integrating an experience, before you go into the experience, like what can the average person do to kind of cultivate the most wisdom uh, after? Yeah. So, you can really profoundly amplify um, the insights that you have by preparing very far in advance. Um, so for example, you might say that, uh, you might notice a particular problem that you have. Um, maybe you have a problem with um, aggression. You've been noticing that you're getting very angry at people for no reason. So you could draw upon the deity of Mars, who um, in its negative aspect um, indicates the uh, forces of aggression, and war and rage and all of this, but also in its positive side uh, implicates uh, the capacity for foresight analysis, uh, being able to enact one's will. And so maybe the complex is that you are having a hard time enacting your will and this is causing some frustration in you. Um, maybe you don't know that yet, but if you pick that particular deity and you um, maybe put an image of it on your desk and you look at it every day, you read about it, uh, you flesh out the symbol as much as possible, uh, and then you can look into um, systems of correspondence uh, to set the setting. Right, so um, you might use um, <coughs> so like red meat is a food that's associated with Mars. Um, so you might like have like a red meat meal that day. Uh, you might use like very heavy um, sorts of uh, red colors around the area, like uh, cover the walls in red, uh, and then use like different stones and like herbs that uh, are reminiscent of this deity. Uh, get incenses that also are correspondences of this deity, and really thoroughly saturate the environment as much as you possibly can with this one archetype, um, and then. Um, Something that I find is very useful is writing your own invocations. Um, so an invocation is basically a, a prayer to activate the energy of a particular archetype. Uh, and there's ones that you can find online, but I find it always more useful to create them for yourself. So uh, if you have uh, a mind for poetry, or even if you don't, um, give it a shot and like create this uh, poetic uh, call to activate this archetype within you. Um, say it at the beginning of the ritual that you set for yourself, and then um, take the mushrooms or whatever, uh, lay down, let it settle in, and then let it take its course. And then as you've done so much work um, amplifying this uh, symbol within you, uh, it's inevitably going to play out in the experience. And uh, the function of all of these associational materials in your environment uh, are to give you constant representations, constant reminders to put you back on track to thinking about this. It's really strengthening and amplifying the signal that this particular uh, idea is um, having uh, on the environment and the context. And uh, if you do all of that, then you can really powerfully, profoundly um, activate and act on uh, these archetypes and symbols as they exist within you by giving them flesh with, this, um, with these images and associations. <laughs>
Um, I had uh, two questions. You mentioned earlier the importance of imagination in these sorts of altered states and you know being able to project yourself into the future. Um, so looking at that from like a neuroscience perspective, the idea of mental time travel and perspective memory, that would be seen in more of like the default mode network. So is there different kinds of imagination that we're talking about, or um, is it one thing? Because that would be sort of contrary to what you spoke about earlier about psychedelics. So, yeah, there's lots of, so the imagination is something that's like, um, whole brain represented um, and so like mental time travel does involve the default mode network but it's about like how that uh, interacts with other networks in your brain um, so it will like for, form functional connections with um, other areas that can help you simulate um, say the representation of yourself across time <coughs> um, and one of the qualities of the psychedelic experience is that your capacity to order things across time does become very disoriented so there is a, a bit of an uh, aberration in that function as a result of um, say that function being disintegrated. Um, so you do see some impairments in that kind of processing uh, as a result of loss of certain higher order integration of uh, neural networks. Um, but one of the key elements in actually generating visualizations as opposed to just like having an abstract likeness of yourself across time is uh, the use of the actual uh, perceptual faculties involved in the perception. So uh, in the psychedelic experience you might get more uh, of an involvement of the memories involved in processing uh, memory and in processing your uh, visual uh, system. So we do actually see that there is a study that shows that um, out of the context of LSD, not only is there an increase in activation on the early areas of your visual cortex, giving you a bunch of noise that can be appropriated to formulate very coherent and vivid mental images, but um, there's also an increase, um, for some reason, especially when you listen to music, uh, between um, this area at the back of your hippocampus and the uh, early visual areas that you have. So you have this um, connection being formed very readily in the psychedelic uh, state, at least as we've imaged with LSD, that uh, connects the areas involved in memory with those that are involved in generating very vivid mental images. Um, so that could be something that's happening, is that uh, you're actually drawing from your uh, memory stores and translating that into image. Um, but yeah, there's definitely like different kinds of um, imagination and I don't know. So maybe through like the ventral pathway, you're having, you know, or visual experiences of imagination rather than of the self. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And my other question was uh, about the Berlin wisdom paradigm. You mentioned that um, there is five criteria for determining someone's wisdom. Uh, I, it seemed like, like I was just wondering how they scored that because it seems like it would be very subjective to determine that. And is there like, um, a bunch of raters and how is the inter-rater reliability? Yeah, so I think they usually use two independent raters um, that have just practiced reading these vignettes a lot and they uh, score them on a scale of one to seven. Um, one being like shows none of this um, quality and seven being does a really good job. Um, so it, yeah, that is one of the problems with a lot of research, especially on wisdom, is that there's like a major subjective element to it. Right, and it's, I guess, hard to come to like a consensus on what should be used to determine it. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's, I think one of the reasons that people don't hear about the research on wisdom a lot is because there's a lot of like infighting amongst the scientists and like hardly anybody agrees on anything. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so that's a problem for sure. I wanted to ask you a question. I have a quote, uh, imaginative uh, personification, right? So say we have to um, uh, meditate on a deity or some sort of uh, uh, figure to get in touch with a certain thing that we're repressing, right? Now, I have a specific question. So, in let's say everyone, the most popular, I think, uh, everyone knows Greek mythology the most in terms of what the options are, right? So, um, I found that Athena, who is the goddess of wisdom, represents warfare, craft, and wisdom, right? So, she's kind of like this merger of all the different things, right? But then you have uh, gods who are specific. So, you have Hephaestus, the god of craftsmanship, you have Mars, uh, Ares, the god of war, and you have Zeus, the god of, you know, the king of the gods, right? So, um, why, what are you, what's your opinion on, should one focus on a monotheistic figure who represents all things, or when is it more appropriate to focus on 
Aries instead of Athena. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Should I focus on, should I do two mushroom sessions, one for Hephaestus and one for Aries? Or can I, can I just focus on Athena because she can fill both bases at once? Um, it all depends on the individual. And so Young actually talks about this in his book, The Seven Sermons of the Dead. And one of his arguments is that um, what? Seven Sermons of the Dead, it's like a Gnostic uh, myth that he writes. It's great. Seven Sermons. Yeah, so one of his ideas is that um, both the concepts of oneness and manyness are important, and that you can't collapse one into the other. Um, because clearly the one and the many are different uh, because they have different ways that you can talk about them. And so there's uses at various times for either of them. I think that it's important to subsume everything within a frame of unity um, because then you provide uh, some sort of like organizing structure around uh, things that can um, keep them contained and then uh, they become more intelligible across time. Whereas if you don't have this sort of unifying framework, it's very easy for things to become differentiated and isolated. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there's sort of a natural tendency towards the interaction between many uh, like the many deities and like the one deity. And that's reflected in that sort of Tibetan tantric Buddhist thing where um, within the Sambhogakaya, the realm of all the celestial deities, um, these are all things that sort of point to their gateways to access um, that one divinity. But um, different people need different gateways and different paths. Um, so there's this relationship between um, the one and the many. Uh, and you just kind of have to figure out where you are on the path, really. And um, how would you recommend people who aren't into symbolism like me? Like, how, where do they get started? What should they do to find out what their, their appropriate deity? Or, uh, or image figure? Like, how would they, how, how do you recommend starting to look like uh, if you're not an artist, right? Whatever captures your attention. Whatever calls out to your interest. Sure. Gravitate towards that. Because even if you don't know why, um, there's some reason. Aside from that, I mean, that's also like, that might be terrible advice too, because sometimes people's demons call out to them. Um, so maybe the appropriate larger answer is that I couldn't do that in a generalized way. But one of the things to look for, if your intuitions are coordinated well, is where your interest gravitates. But to be careful, because sometimes your intuitions are not well coordinated. Yeah, so have a backup. Uh, yeah, uh, that's where you need a community of people to talk. So duality, so we should have a dualistic system, so two gods in opposition. Like Zoroastrianism, that's what we need. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's yeah. do that. Yeah. No more burials, only burning. <laughs> <laughs> Full circle. So this is the last lecture of this series. Um, are there going to be more like this, and then how do we stay connected to this community? Oh yeah, so I made a Facebook group um, called The Psychedelic State. Um, I think I posted it a while ago on the Facebook page, but I can also post it again, um, so you can join that if you'd like. Um, we don't have Facebook, right? Right. Um, Yeah, you could uh, join the mailing list for the Toronto Psychedelic Society. That would be a good way. Um, they do lots of events, lots of lectures um, around the U of T community. Um, oh, the Neurology Research Association um, that Harley's a part of is currently starting to do some similar events at York. Um, what else is happening recently? Yeah, I don't know of anything happening too immediately. It's like end of a semester and... Yeah, yeah. I'm saying like, yeah, next year. So are you going to be doing um, I will likely be doing this again um, next September. Yeah. Um, I was hoping you could talk just a little bit more about what you're involved in the Canadian Student for Sensible Drug Policy. Just how you, just how you guys kind of came together. What your general mission is. Obviously, it's for sensible drug policy. Yeah. But how, as students, you guys are enacting that. True. And so this will probably would be the last question actually, because the care tech is going to come in and get very annoyed at us in a second. But, um, so there's a national board for CSSDP, and they have a bunch of people that like integrate and coordinate um, students. Have a good night. And so I was a part of that board for a while, because there isn't really a U of T chapter. Um, I've been directing it since, and actually I am departing the U of T chapter um, to focus more on academic work um, in my organizational capacity. So if anybody's at U of T and wants to like um, volunteer, there's lots of space for that. Um, what we focus on mostly at U of T is like more of this educational kind of events, and then um, through events like this and the Mapping the Mind with Mushroom conference that we uh, host, we raise money and donate it to MAPS. We're doing psychedelic research, so that's one of our main things is um, funneling funds into actually making the research happen. Uh, otherwise, it's like education, um, providing uh, resources, harm reduction resources for people. We also do occasionally um, drug checking workshops where we sell reagent kits to uh, enable people to um, make better choices and so on. 
but the national board also is involved in like sending petitions to the government sometimes. Um, there was like a cannabis petition that we had in Toronto a while ago um, to try to get the people to let up on the dispensaries when they were raiding them. Uh, so it's really determined by the students, because uh, it's all very bottom-up driven, but um, it's a bit of a mix of uh, advocacy, education, um, running petitions, and uh, I think that's sort of the main core of things. Cool. All right, cool. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um,